uh, we have confirmation of the agenda. Uh, Yolanda and Brock, all in favor? Gary. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest. I will, I, and I don't know exactly if we're talking Wh about where and when where. you will. But if there is ever discussion about wages within the within the um, daycare, I will be. I will not be part of that discussion. Noted. Thank you. Okay. Somebody took my ruler out of here. Maybe this is so. Uh, uh, point four on the agenda. Okay. Donna is to take over on the 2018 draft budget. Okay. Well, actually, Dwayne's going to um, open up uh, for you at this point. So we'll turn it over to Dwayne. Thanks. So I want to thank council and staff. We've got slide rule. I'm using a slide rule. <laughs> this one was just fine professional. This was fine. Okay. 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 And uh, on Friday, you would have received the first draft of the 2018 uh, budget. Um, and what we've done is we've uh, taken the budget and we've put it into a presentation form. And then we're going to walk you through the presentation. Um, and uh, we'll certainly take questions as we go. So we divide this kind of into three parts. The first is capital, um, proposed 2018 capital expenditures. Uh, the second part looks at the 2018 operating uh, expenditures. It uses the same uh, service categories that we used last November, which are based on the province's template. Um, and department heads, when we get to the operating part, will be presenting their respective department budgets uh, for council. The third part of the presentation poses some topics for council to discuss. Uh, through the presentation, what we're looking for as staff is feedback as to what changes uh, council would like to see um, in the budget that uh, we're going to present. Um, this is the first draft, as I've indicated, of the 2018 budget. Uh, discussion is certainly encouraged, very much so. Um, we've set aside two to three hours for tonight's discussion and another two to three hours tomorrow night. Um, if we need to schedule more time to discuss the first draft, we can certainly do that. Um, we do it by motion to council. So we'll see between tonight, hopefully tonight, tomorrow night, we can get through everything, but if council needs certainly additional time, uh, that would be council's prerogative. Turn over to Donna's yeah. couple comments. So just a couple comments. So again, thank you to everyone for all their hard work to get us to our first round with the numbers. Um, in the next round, then, we will um, have your year-to-dates in there. As I said, we had this put together uh, before Christmas, so we didn't have the year-to-date numbers ready, so we'll get those added in. And also, prior, we're at, right now, we're headed into year-end, so there's a lot of year-end entries, adjustments, and stuff that we um, have to make to get our final numbers. Also, um, you'll notice some format changes in, in the um, budget uh, layout. Um, we've separated capital out. I'm not um, completely happy with that layout, but I'll make some uh, more changes to make it um, uh, much more clear for the next round. So, and another uh, topic that we'll be discussing is, that is a change this time is machine revenge. So Sean and I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about that when that comes up. So thanks, and we'll move on to the next slide. So you've seen this slide before, and as we go through the budget, uh, we do ask that you consider these three questions and these are three questions that we ask council to keep in the back of their mind in november so the first question is what are council's priorities um, in 2015 council adopted the strategic plan uh, the plan has been used by staff in preparing reports and recommendations um, this is an election year and uh, council is encouraged to think about priorities for 2018 but also priorities beyond 2018 and the budget, um, all budgets, are about doing what is in the best interest of the municipality. So something just to keep in the back of our minds as we go through this process. Um, as as uh, previously mentioned last fall, there are three ways um, priorities can be determined. Um, 
moving on to the second question, how a priority is going to be determined. There's three ways. They can be determined by recommendations from staff, they can be determined by the public, or they can be determined here at the council table. Uh, staff, as I mentioned, is seeking direction as to how council wants to establish their priorities. Last question has to do with long-term capital planning decisions. A number of reports and studies have been completed over the last year, and they all come, as we know, with significant price tags. Council needs to consider these reports and identify their long-term capital spending priorities. So moving on, again, this is a carryover from last fall. Where, where are we? What are, where are we starting from, essentially? Well, we know that we have debt obligations until 2032. As you'll see, we've looked at our 2018 commitments and we're at $750,550. We, our two highest expenditures are protection and recreation and cultural services and those in the draft budget you'll see are maintained. Our lowest expenditure is around the development. We also know that in terms of maintaining our existing services, our operating budget would need to increase by 1.3 million over the next five years. In 2017, um, now I'm going to come back to this. It won't be necessarily tonight, um, <coughs> more so likely tomorrow night. But in 2017, five million of a 16 million dollar budget was raised by taxation. It actually works out that 31 percent of the budget was raised through taxation, and there is an increase that does increase uh, through this draft budget. We'll come to that later. Reserve reserve funds total 10 million. Over $2 million is needed per year over the next five years to fund our future capital expenditures. We also need to bear in mind that we have a slow tax assessment growth, but we're also are challenged with our increasing operating costs. So things that are beyond our control, hydro, gas, um, minimum wage, provincial, and we'll speak to that in a little bit more detail. So in terms of the first draft of the budget, uh, to balance the budget, uh, it does require a taxation increase currently of 14.49% or it that increased to $715.88. Um, in terms of our taxation, a 1% tax increase uh, for 2018 is going to generate $48,916.40. So that's our, our benchmark. So as this slide shows, and we've seen this before, the tax increases over the last five years have been minimal. Um, it's within the last two years that we've started to see some tax increases of greater than 3%. Um, to reduce the 14.49% to something more reasonable, um, Council is going to have some difficult decisions that they need to make. So in terms of, there are... Oh, sorry, can I go ahead, Mike? Yeah. Um, some things to keep in mind as we go forward through our numbers. Um, there are decisions yet to be made by council that may impact the 2018 budget. So, as directed by council, there will be a staff report coming for the new year outlining options for the museum. Um, among the options will be undertaking some or all of the work outlined in the museum feasibility study. If council was to approve work to be done on the building, it is unlikely the work would be undertaken in 2018 because of the tendering process and potentially linked up period. That said, if council wants to see money in the budget for the project, we can certainly revise the draft budget accordingly. Um, it won't be known uh, until early in the new year if the OCIF top-up application is successful, moving on to the Mill Street. If it is successful, the project will be discussed with council and it have to be financed. It's currently not in the draft team budget. The most likely finance option for borrowing or the increased taxation. Um, we don't have the funds in reserves to fund that particular project. Just, just a question. Is that amount to finish Mill Street? For the next phase of Mill Street. The next phase. So that's another another block. Is that what we're talking? Maybe Sean can you know, the, uh, the OSIF application was set up specifically to complete. It would take us right to the end of Mill Street and then, and then pop. So it would, it would handle the entirety of the main, uh, of the storm trunk main. Okay. It does not include any of the necessary tie-ins. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think it was about 810 meters. It's a fairly large portion of trunk. I have a question, do Sean, then. So that would take you to 800 meters, would take you to um, take you one block or 
No, no. It would take you right to the block. end of Mill Street. Right. Yeah. It would take you to the end of Mill Street and then, to be honest, I can't say whether it would, whether it would go east or west on that, but that it would finish that whole front lane and, and at that point you would be able to tie it in the it. Where the public school used to be, CC, whatever it was. Yeah, it's, it's right beyond that, right to the tail end. To the next one. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's, it's a fairly aggressive uh, it, it's project. To say yeah, that. that's why we had applied for 11 years. <laughs> okay. Nice. Right over to McConnell Street. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. You got it? Yeah. So, yeah. There's no. Yeah. That's the next. No. It seemed to me that there was a drain. Okay. Maybe Brock knows uh -huh. there was a drain that came from the next street over, but there was a knee to it. It comes from Hamilton yeah. Damil okay. Street. Okay. Okay. I'm good. So, any other. My, my comments would be anything that we, any details with regards to these projects could be done outside of tonight and figured out where what we need done. Yes, try to stay on. It's going to keep us probably. Keep it to the budget. And I just had one more question. That was one you say we would know about the top up. We won't, we won't know until early in the new year. So, February. Okay, thanks. So in terms of moving on, um, as council is aware, we're currently going through a pre-servicing analysis. Um, as, count, as directed by council, public meeting has been called for January the 17th. Uh, council has until March the 25th to make a decision. If council decides to maintain or expand the existing fleet service, additional dollars will, be need, will need to be added to the budget to undertake a facility assessment review. Of the fleet services building. Um, if council decides to disband the fleet service, the cost to rate payers will be approximately half a million, four hundred fifty, four hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. And depending if that council makes a decision before March, then the OPT were to assume service in the fall, that's a, that's a potential impact on our budget for 2018. Um, there is some money that we have in reserves that we could use. Uh, depending on the decision of council, but we know that not the full amount is available in reserves that we would be having to look to finance of some form or nature. <coughs> um, borrowing would likely be necessary um, pending council's decision. In the near future, council is going to receive a report regarding the outcome of the pay equity market. <coughs> the results of the review are unknown. However, staff anticipate that there will be an impact on the 2018 budget. Uh, we don't know that amount. Um, hopefully, we know what by the end of January at the latest. Council will be receiving an update report at the next regular meeting. Council regarding the house and dam project. The outcome of the study is unknown. However, possible options to deal with the house and dam are to repair or potentially demolish the existing structure. In either case, it is going to require some uh, dollars uh, to undertake that work. The airport feasibility study is previously discussed. Um, is being presented on January the 15th. The report uh, will contain options for council's consideration. Um, depending on what councils decide, that may also um, require some dollars in the 2018 budget. So as you can see, um, there are still some unknowns at this point, but we're certainly, uh, as, as information becomes available, we'll certainly continue to work through that and build that into the budget. So the two projects alone, uh, the museum renovation, if council has decided to go ahead with that, and the Mill Street project, were at um, $780,000. Um, and again, that is money that is currently not in the draft budget. So that 14.49% does not include these expenses. So speaking of debt, again, we've seen this slide before. This slide summarizes our debt obligations. And as previously noted, if you look at the bottom of the slide, um, our annual uh, debt repayment currently sits at $250,000. Um, and as previously noted, we have debt till 2032. 
and as long as they're paid off, it was a good practice to redirect those funds into an infrastructure reserve fund. Um, so first one that we would be paying off would be 2021. So once that loan is paid off, the funds that were currently of 34,000, approximately 35,000, we would redirect those funds into reserve account beginning in 2022, essentially. Council uh, has also committed $500,000 um, to the Memorial Hall. Um, and it's right at the bottom there on that slide. And the reason for it is in terms of we have a commitment, of we have an outstanding commitment of $235,388. Um, in the draft 2018 budget, uh, we're recommending a payment of $50,000. Uh, and that is in the draft budget. But as you can see, if we were to continue at a payment schedule of 50,000 and we owe 235, we're looking at approximately five years to pay off that debt that, we're, that we owe to the Black Memorial Hall. So that's just something to keep in mind, that that is not borrowed money, but it is a debt that we as a council and municipality owe. Um, the purpose this is really sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. So the purpose of this slide is to show you our 20, 2018 commitment. Most, if not all, of the items on the slide are non-negotiable. Um, as part of our joint land strategy that we have with uh, municipality of Moore's Turnberry, uh, we do have to uh, complete Arthur Street, and our cost is $229,042. Uh, council moving down hospital pledge. Council has committed 50,000 to the hospital for a five year time period, and that is five years is up till 2020. As I've indicated, we have the uh, commitment to the Memorial Hall, and the recommended amount uh, towards that debt is 50,000. And we have the uh, streetlight LED project. Um, Staff, uh, the cost there, as you'll see, is $421,000. Um, staff have uh, submitted a grant application for 50% of the total cost of this. Um, but if the application is unsuccessful, that means that that full amount, the $421,000, will need to be borrowed as part of our 2018 budget. So we still have the commitment. Um, we've entered into a contract for it. Uh, we have to follow through on it. The question is, are we responsible for half or the full amount? And that will depend on whether or not we're successful on the grant application. So potentially you're looking at another $210,000 impact on your 2018 budget. Um, I've already mentioned pay equity, but that's another uh, commitment. At this point, as I said, we don't know what the impact will be. Um, once we get the study, we'll need to investigate financing options for the recommendations. Um, if there's a recommendation in there that speaks specifically to pay equity, then uh, we will have to implement that in 2018. We won't have a choice. But in terms of other factors, we will we can look at other ways of financing it uh, in, in, in 2018 or, or beyond. So this is just to give you a little bit of an idea in terms of currently where we're, how things are shaping up. So just some highlights uh, where uh, we did receive, we're, we're, I hear one of few municipalities that did receive an increase in our own funding of an increase was to the tune of $34,000. So that's good news. Um, our capital spending that we're required to spend uh, is $1.2 million. Um, as I've indicated, um, province passed uh, new legislation that uh, impacts the minimum wage. We have, a, we have staff who are currently working at minimum wage and the impact on the budget for 2018 in terms of moving them all up to minimum wage is approximately $20,000. Um, we have cost of living increase um, based on our policy. It calculates up to 1.5%. And just to give you an idea, if you look at full-time staff only, the uh, impact at 1.5% for full-time staff only is about $33,000. Um, we also in 2018 have an election. Um, the cost for that is going to be $23,000. Uh, we currently have 5,000 in reserves. So the, 
um, we're, we need to budget in our 2018 budget of about 18 and 19 thousand uh, dollars to undertake the 2018 election. Uh, council also committed to $2,500 to our new economic development committee. Um, and you're going to see, and Pat will speak to those a bit more detail, the recreation master plan. And as you will recall, we had our asset management plan updated, and they're recommending that we transfer $127,826 in into reserves um, to, for infrastructure, um, to start building up our infrastructure uh, account uh, for uh, future projects. And Donna's going to take it over here in terms of uh, capital. Okay. So thank you. So I know this slide is very teeny tiny and you have to, um, um, we're going to be going through each item on it and there is a copy of this slide actually in your um, printout of your budget as well. So um, I'm just going to give you the page number at the back of your budget there. Thank you. So this, this slide is on page 61 of your purple copy there of your budget just so that you can see it a little bit better. So we're going to um, move forward into the various um, parts of the 2018 capital in individually. Oh, it's it's page 61 in your purple copy of your printout just to make it I printed you those just to make it a little easier instead of flipping back and forth. We can see how that works tonight and decide whether you want to do that or not. Okay, so the first item, and uh, we have both um, Sean, your Director of Public Works here, and Pat, um, Director of Recreation and Facilities, who is here to, with you tonight. And both of them have various um, capital items that we're going to be talking about. So both of you feel free to jump in at, at whatever point, and um, Council may have some questions if they would like you to answer on those um, particular items. So the first one is for um, the final cover for Westmoreland Street in Blythe to finish up that project at 30273 Um Dwayne uh, mentioned the Arthur Street, the Phase 2 project. We're going to use some grant money and some money we have in reserve um, to complete that project estimated at $229,000. <coughs> we want to continue on with the Rural Tower and Chip Program and um, I don't think the specific um, ones have been um, have been decided on at this point, but I think Sean has an idea to put top lifts on some of the other roads that have already been done. So, would you like to speak to that, Sean? Well, okay. Basically, very briefly, uh, yes, we're looking at there's a couple of areas on uh, Reed Road and Long Creek, particularly in the intersections, that uh, definitely would need a second. Uh, a second application to ensure that they're uh, that they have the the strength and integrity to, to handle the traffic levels that they get. Uh, we also, in that fund, would like to continue with what we started, I guess, last year. That being some of the crack ceiling on our existing uh, rural roads as well. Uh, beyond that, we would uh, be relying on an assessment this spring to see uh, what the conditions of uh, of the roads, and if further attention is required, we would use these funds for. Um, so also at this point there's um, three potential pieces of equipment. There is a four-wheel drive pickup, um, a mower, and a trackless sidewalk machine. So the, um, the uh, four-wheel drive pickup is estimated at 42739 the mower 25440 the um, trackless machine at 149 uh, 1097 and Sean is hoping to realize some funds from selling some other pieces of equipment. So Sean, would you like to give a bit of a um, an overview on those capital items? Absolutely, thank you. Um, basically, uh, you see the pickup in front of you, that's basically what we're looking at is, is our existing um, inventory. Uh, some of our older units are getting to the point, uh, and our oldest is an O2 with uh, over 225,000 kilometers on it. Uh, they're getting to the point where keeping them could pr prove to be cost prohibitive. Uh, it's an older vehicle, higher higher mileage and higher maintenance would be required. So we're looking at trying to keep moving forward with that. Um, the mower is, a, is an interesting and important one. Uh, the guys last year were able to uh, step back from some of the contracting work for the rural uh, road uh, 
grass trimming and that sort of thing. Our existing mower is a is a rear uh, unit, so your guy, the crew is basically looking over the shoulder. They're not really as productive as they could be. This mower that we're we're specking is a front mount, and uh, our expectation is that because now your operator is looking forward, you got the safety component that's uh, that's uh, part of the equation, as well as the fact that if the operator is comfortable, his productivity increases. And our thinking is that uh, by going to this newer mower, we would definitely be in a position to, to uh, eliminate contracting out and be able to do a very good job with the, with the roadsides on the, uh, in the rural, rural areas. Um, the final unit is, of course, a trackless. We have two tracklesses. Um, currently, they're being used primarily for winter. They do a little bit of street uh, sidewalk sweeping with them as well. But for the better part, they're using them as a winter uh, uh, piece of equipment. The oldest of the two is a 1986 model. And it's safe to say that it's, it's, it's served the township very well. Um, the price you see in front of you, though, includes not only the, the, uh, the replacement trackless unit, but there's two pieces of equipment that we would, we would want uh, council to consider. One being a 14-foot deck mower. Uh, used these things in the past, and it makes very short work of, of larger cutting areas. So, you know, you start looking at the trackless as a, as a year-round piece of equipment, um, and these things, will, these things will handle a vast area in a very short period of time. So you're increasing your productivity. Uh, the other piece of equipment is fairly new and is referred to as a ribbon blower. Uh, without getting into too many of the details, the, the current snow blowers are, are a dual auger. And uh, you know, we've recently looked at, a, at the sidewalk costings. If we're blowing snow, we have to slow way down because there's only so much that these things can handle. The ribbon blowers are an extremely aggressive piece of equipment designed um, to handle heavy snow, wet snow and ice with no issues whatsoever. So basically, the speed that the operator can, uh, can run forward with is significantly enhanced. Expensive piece of equipment, but uh, moves a lot more snow and it moves it quicker. So the, the more you were talking about the time, will fit on will fit onto the trackless machine too. The, no that other the first mower? No the second like you're talking of uh, uh, 15 foot more or something. 14, like that. 14, 14 foot that is uh, specifically a trackless unit. Okay. They, they have hydraulic wings so you can you can pull mm -hmm. wing up get into tight areas. But they're designed it's proprietary it's designed for trackless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. One of the things that I've had <clears throat> mentioned about a few times with regards to equipment purchases is equipment utilization, which I think you've, you've, you've talked a little bit about, about the equipment that we're utilizing and are we utilizing it to its full, full potential. <clears throat> the other part of it is, is my question's always been about payback, about what some of these, like what, when we buy certain equipment for whatever reason are we getting some type of savings or efficiencies or whatever that would determine that we are going to get a payback by buying something and then saving repairs mates or whatever the question that always has come up is when we make that decision based on those efficiencies and those in those um whether we don't need that more or do need that more we don't really get a sense of have we have we have we actually earned the payback that we've actually discussed? So the question is, if we if, if we do buy something, did we do it, and then it end up for fruition, make up make sense at the, at the end of the day? Because right now, like, you tell me if we need a four wheel pickup truck. Do we like just because of our current inventory? Great, but have we done a utilization of that? We actually need that pickup truck within the fleet, and and and, and these other things that it's great that you tell me that we that the productivity is. But what is the payback of these these equipment? And is it two years, five years, whatever? So that when we when we talk about taxation increase or talk whatever, we have to sell this stuff. This is this is the conversation that we have to sell it to the taxpayer. And there will be people that say, why do we need another pickup truck? Why do we need another mower? Those are the types of things that we need, I need. I don't know the rest of the council, but I would like to see 
from a from a when we talk about capital spending because we have to ensure that we, we can sell this to not only us but sell it to the taxpayer if we, we talk about a tax increase. Right. No, we're, we're getting rid of the tech up, right? And buying it for it back. Right? That's correct. And, and right. that's so I think we, it's something we have to have. You, we all know you can't run your vehicles forever. Right? So I think I don't have a problem selling that. Because you have to do it. Right. And, and, and in keeping with, uh, with Councillor's uh, question or statement, yeah. yeah, I'm in no way implying that we would be increasing rolling stock inventory. This would be an in out. Uh, Trackless is a good example. Uh, it's a very expensive piece of equipment. But with that, you get a 15-year service life. And uh, in discussions with the crew, should council choose to go ahead with that, you can see in the, as a part of the line item, there would be some revenue because we're looking at the rolling stock overall and saying we would rather have one piece of equipment that's, that's purpose-built and use that and maybe eliminate two or three pieces of, of equipment that we don't use, that we, we don't necessarily utilize to their full potential. That's when you look at this trackless unit as an example. The whole idea is we've got two of them sitting there that we don't really use to their full potential. I'd like to see it to where we have equipment that's running year round, if at all possible. I have another question too. So the, you know we're going to the fleet mower again. Can you explain that again? Is that is that for the rural area? That one? Uh, number two on the list. Yes, yeah. that's so correct. That's, that's the for one, the roadside. You're going to replace the one we have got now. One we've been using this past summer. Correct, and it's so it's, it's in very poor shape. Does it get more? Right? Okay, I don't have a problem here. Okay. Does that more handle storms? <laughs> I'm talking about the little boats. I know, but there's that's what we have pressures for. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> like the roadsides are, are a hard piece, a hard door to the factor. Yes. And not everybody can cut the side of the road with their mom. And <coughs> I, I quite <coughs> that amount of money for. What we have on some of our roadsides that you can possibly get into with more stones being the worst. Um, you know, you see a guy dumping stones to the side of the road, the first thing I tell him is to move on his side of the fence, on my side of the fence. You know, kind of thing. <coughs> those things do happen. So, how do we? That's a lot of money for a more to cut roadsides for. I can come back with the specifications on the unit that was spec. This was this was something that was brought forward by our operations supervisor, and he looked at the options that were out there. Okay, and okay. and was so is, it, is it a disc bind or a flail, or do you know? You know, it's okay. I'm not sure. Let me clarify that because we were looking at both. Okay, okay, because I know they're both there. But mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Okay. Whatever. I guess the idea or the question I have <clears throat> is. Does this present payback to what we currently pay for contracting that task out? Because if, if, if I, and you don't have to answer right now, Sean, I'm just saying if, if we're buying a piece of equipment, the idea is it's supposed to save us money operationally from contracting that out. If it doesn't, what's the purpose? That's That would be my position is because Irregardless of, it's great to have stuff in house, but if we're not getting, if we're not saving any the taxpayer, if it's cost prohibitive to do that from a time and labor and, and, and equipment and all that, then that's the question I have. I, I have not been involved in any council meetings where we determined whether that we didn't want to have contracted out service. I have, I don't remember that conversation if we did. I just want to know that whatever service we have, it's 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 the best possible bang for the buck. And the contract the note is better than having the equipment and the labor to do it. I'm okay with having a contract the note. But we need to understand that. I can get back to you with the actual numbers. We had that discussion and uh, unfortunately I don't have the exact numbers, but the contracting uh, piece for the rural roadsides was quite high on an annual basis. So our, our feeling yeah. was that utilization of our own equipment and our own forces was actually a savings. But let me come back with, with the numbers that's, on that one. That's okay. Good. Brock. Oh, I, I hear about, I, don't, I know nothing about this equipment, but uh, 
uh, I hear of the controls that are on some of the vehicles, for example. You can tell where the vehicle is, what it's doing, what it's working at, and so on. Uh, it, are we close to a point where we can say, well, we, we can go back through that data and we can say how much work was done by this machine and how much it cost and what are the labor costs associated with it and so on. Are we, are we near that point uh, with, with this type of equipment? With the GPS systems we're using, I can tell you that the last snowfall that we used in a snowblower in an MT or in a trackless unit, it took six hours and 52 minutes to do green and five hours and 25 minutes to do black. You know, that's, that's the level of, of uh, access to data that we have now. With these, with these new GPS units, they're fantastic. So the plan is to use that kind of data to do uh, analysis. an analysis of... Uh, it allows me to answer the questions when, when, yeah. when they come to the I'll, I'll make the one statement. Because of looking at the stones that have showed up on the roadsides, basically, when the snow goes away, I think we need all the ditches drove by a tractor that has a stone fork on it to gather the loose ones up. And that would save us money in the long run. Also, uh, they would gather up pieces of timber, branches, big branches, and stuff as well, which would make it quicker for the more to pass by. Okay. Okay. We're ready to go ahead. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So um, we'll move on then, Sean, to the house and dam. So if you could uh, just give us a, uh, what your update is for the house and dam. Okay, yes, as, as mentioned earlier, there will be a report coming forward at the next council meeting to, uh, to update council on our current status. <coughs> um, what you see before you in terms of the, the budget itself is the net cost that would be necessary to cover um, costs associated with the stability analysis. So at the end of that, with the $5,088 plus the uh, uh, the reserve transfer, we have sufficient funds to have covered that cost. So moving on then, Sean, the next um, the next few are yours as well. So do you want to just move down the page, if you would, please? Certainly. <clears throat> the cemetery software, I, I don't know if, uh, if the documents in front of you mentioned Stone Orchard. That's just yeah. as an example. That's of, an example of uh, a program. Correct. That's in no way are we indicating that that we would recommend that specific one. This is something that would go through appropriate procurement processes. But basically, uh, from what I'm seeing at the two cemeteries at the time, we're at that point where we should be trying to digitize our information and, and move away from older paper documentation into, into something that's it's uh, more reliable and, uh, and consistent. Thank you for that. Uh, again, that would go through full procurement, uh, should it be the desired council to move ahead with something like that. Uh, there's, as I understand, there's quite a few uh, programs or packages on there. I'm just wondering about the status of, uh, of uh, Blythe Cemetery. And I've been given to understand there are an awful lot of gaps. And, Old records that are missing or, or uh, unavailable or unreliable. This is this is my concern, Councillor. Like, I can't speak to the specifics of, of Blythe right now. I know just in in the short time I've been here that the records that I'm seeing are in a format that would not be what I would consider to be reliable in, in the long term, or easily transferable, or easily tra And that brings up a very important point. This this is a big number. It's not all for software. The, it's been my past experience that it's all very well and good to go buy software. But if you haven't got someone who's, who's appropriately trained to transfer the data into it and, and, to, and to turn over a functional uh, program, it's really not worthwhile. So part of that cost, uh, part of this budgeted cost would not only be the purchase of the software, but the 
the population of the data and, and the, uh, the implementation of the program. We may have some data that would be useful. I mean, we have an awful lot of stuff that people have dropped off. Okay. See, working your way through all of that data is, is a desperately time consuming uh, exercise. We would want to know that if we were going to go this route, it would be my recommendation to council that we had somebody who knew what they were doing. I, I wouldn't want to see you know, just a, a seasonal personal person entering the data. Someone who's not not be the uh, cognizant of the sensitive nature of the, of the information. Right, Sean, that 50,000, well, that, that, that's the program, and that's that's basically that's having somebody set it all up to, like everybody's plot beyond there and everything, and then we just continue on from that. That would be my focus. Okay. Like I say, I, I yeah. wouldn't want to just purchase the software, have it sitting there on the CD or whatever, and expect, you know, us to work on it on our spare time. Yeah. And our spare time. You would want to fully implement it. <laughs> we're just trying to stay out of there. <laughs> um, moving on to the niche wall, uh, it's my understanding that we're we're getting very very low in in available niches. Uh, um, for this amount, is this are these figures taken from the supplier of the previous uh, section of niche wall? can't speak to where the source of that was, but that brings up a very important point. You have to consider consistency when, when you're moving forward. Otherwise, uh, you know, I've, I've seen in the past where you have a cemetery that has a variety of different niche walls. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So um, I'm not sure what the, the cost was on the last one. I, well, maybe Donna can speak to that. Yeah, I think by the time it was all the, the domed one at Wingham, by the time it was all landscaped and the cement and all that stuff, I think it was up around the fifty thousand dollars. But I understood that a lot of that cement work and stuff then would would enable <coughs> another one to be there without laying more cement. So um, if this part goes through, you have to go through RFP and gathering, you know, what's suitable and all of that. So it's just. Um, Step one to say that it's um, requiring further investigation in the budget. And Goliath went with the, with the walls. Um, so I haven't heard any comments on them. But. It's just one thing is that there's one of the national suppliers uh, <coughs> is, works with the Auburn Cemetery and Daryl Ball is acting as an agent for them and what they are putting in uh, what they put in at Auburn uh, quite a bit less than half of what the other suppliers uh, that the company's actually out of North Bay but uh, that I think that's something that we would look at and the RFP is something that we would have to look at very carefully because Auburn didn't think they could afford it and that's why they went to being a dealer. Okay, so next is the water for Arthur Street then, John. Okay, yeah, and as you can see, that, that's the user fee component, I believe, uh, for the overall Arthur Street project that we discussed, uh, referenced earlier. Um, okay, sorry, the uh, LED project, uh, I think Dwayne spoke to that already, the 421,508, unless there's any questions, uh, that was covered. Uh, again, Arthur sorry, Street, we've got Jeffrey, the, sorry, sorry, I just, I just want to confirm. The LED project, when we talk about long-term borrowing, we're borrowing from ourselves. So in essence, there's no impact to tax, there's no impact to the budget, taxation-wise, at all. It's we're paying, we're paying ourselves back, in essence, with the savings that we're paying for. So, so cash flow isn't an impact here. I'm hearing. That's what I, that's why the intention is what I believed, that we are long-term borrowing from ourselves and any savings was going back to repay that, that, that. That's correct. And any, any savings on top of that would be put into a reserve fund. Okay. 
So I'll just clear that this 421,000 does not have any impact to the taxation base at all in the 14 percent. No, that's right. Correct. And as far as the, the LED retrofit, I think it's a, just as a sidebar, it's important to note that giving, given assurances by Realtor of Energy that this should be fully up and functional by March 31st. So any savings that are realized for 2018 will be from March 31st on. It won't be the, the entire year. Just, that, just as a sidebar, this does have an impact on the overall budget. Uh, over at Arthur Street, as again, uh, the sewer piece for Arthur Street uh, amounts to the 26671. Uh, collection system repairs, Veolia. Uh, in all fairness, uh, this probably should be in the operating side. I think uh, Donna had mentioned that to me. Uh, since I've been here, what I've already seen is, is Veolia is actively um, finding collection system problems. Uh, you know, we get sewer backups. Just this fall, you may have noticed around Wingham, there was five or six excavations that took place, some long-standing uh, blockages, obstructions, uh, reductions in, in quality of, of sewer service that were resolved. Uh, it was my understanding that there's a lot more. And as they come across these things, we wanted to have the funds available so that if they get into a uh, part of the, the sanitary sewer system, that's been impacted by roots, be it in Wingham or Blythe, we, uh, we have the resources to be able to go ahead and fix it without saying, okay, you know what, we'll just limp through for another year. Kind of so we were able to get, uh, I believe it was five of them that were sorted out this fall. You may have seen the, the patches around town, the patches of gravel that were, uh, that the asphalt was done late in the season. So that's what that's to do with. Um, this Wingham sewage treatment plant sludge project, I'm still trying to get a little bit more detail on it. Basically, uh, this was a long-standing capital project that um, that uh, Veolia was interested in seeing us complete that would partition off a portion of the lagoon uh, to designate it as, as uh, sludge storage, and, and they would aerate it. It would, uh, it would allow better operation and a, and a more appropriate place to store uh, waste sludge. At the, at the Wingham site. Um, if it's a desire council, I can get uh, some more information <coughs> on that as we as I go forward. And I think that yeah, I can't speak to the police handguns, so. <laughs> so Tim isn't here, but um, as part of um, uh, Tim's budget, and he has brought forward that um, they would need to replace the police handguns, should the, depending on the outcome of the whole OPP study. And when we spoke with Tim, that he was saying that if if the decision gets made that they, they would switch to OPP, then they wouldn't be buying these guns and they would be, um, you know, if that decision was made, it would take till October to make that to be um, underway. So they would make do with what they have and the, this amount would not be purchased. Yeah, I, ju I just think from for somebody who we would, the it might be better to name them actually as handguns as opposed to rifles because yes. oh, because we yeah. did oh. buy rifles the right. question will be yes that why are we buying change. more in rifles yeah so we um actually so there are a few wording changes throughout as i said by the time your your presentation got posted in eScribe, staff found some you know some different uh, small changes so yeah, the presentation that we have it is definitely because that's one of the ones that I, I'm looking. Yes, yeah, so I don't remember that. <laughs> and I'm looking back, and then it says no. It says hang on. I'm like, okay, now I understand. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah. But yes, that's changed. So that. they're not intended to go to war with the OPP. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not with Trump. Okay. So moving on then. So um, Pat, you can maybe speak to the balance of the theater renovations, sure. which are funded through their, uh, their no effect on the tax dollars. Right. So those are funds that have already been raised and are in their uh, reserve account. They do have intentions to spend them on theater improvements and those improvements um, will be done and completed next year. So it's really just an in and out right now showing in the budget. And then next is the wayward signs. I'm not sure of the status. I believe these signs have been ordered, and we're just waiting for them to arrive. These were these have been ongoing for a couple of years, 
and those funds were received from homecoming way back when. So um, I'm sure these signs are, are ready to arrive. So that would be good to get that project done. So, excuse me, Donna, if that's just in and out too. Yes, correct. Yeah. We've had the money sitting in reserves for that for quite a few years. Um, so the next one, Pat, you can maybe expand upon in the 2017 budget. We had planned on doing some um, replacement of fire hall grades for 6,500. But actually, for 2018, we are using that money because it, we didn't uh, do the project in 17. And actually, you're looking at a cost now of 8,000. Right. So it's just a, no, a project that didn't get completed in 2017. And uh, we'll be looking at that's for the Wingham Fire Hall. There's floor grates, and they're, um, the concrete has uh, eroded next to the metal grates so badly that um, it's becoming a trip hazard inside the hall when they're jumping on the trucks and getting off the truck. So we do need to take care of that in 2018. Okay, Pat, I actually think the whole rest of the list is belongs to you. So if you want to just carry on, that sure. would be great, please. Uh, it does say there the Bly Fire Hall ESDC generator, but that has been removed as an item. Right. Um, the block police roof, we've had a long discussion about that. We have the quote, we're just waiting for the weather to uh, replace the north side of the police station, and an OPP decision will be made prior to that date being available anyway. So um, we'll just have to wait and see um, where that takes us, but that is the amount that we need to do to replace the roof. The north side. South side. Whatever. It, it was the uh, side. South side. <laughs> south side. Okay. Yeah. I just turned myself around. Okay. Yeah, it is the south side. I apologize. It, yeah, north you, side. You, is you said south side other times. Oh, you yeah. know. Stay Thank with you. me. Just seeing if you were listening, Neil. Oh, okay. Just check it. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry about that. Um, the trail bridge restoration. So this is the Greenway Trail. Um, we received a costing an estimate from Van Ross to repair the walking bridge and it's also the bridge used by the snowmobile and it's where you walk under the bridge along the Greenway Trail. So that is the amount that um, is in question. Um, this is something um, we're not sure whether council is going to approve us doing this or not. We have also been working with um, G2G and trying to work uh, and get in touch with snowmobile and connect with them. So it's really over the next year we have to address the situation. We have until the end of 2018 to make the repairs. Um, if we choose to keep the bridge and walkway open, um, if we choose to continue the lease on the Greenway Trail or turn it over to, so there's many options um, with this item. Um, but if we do choose to do the repairs, we, we did do need the money in the budget. So that is why that is there. Council may want to have that as, as one of their discussion pieces. I don't have a lot of information as it is a project scheduled to be slated for 2018. Um, I just know the budget figure that was presented by BM Ross uh, Structural Engineers. We have a lot of uh, investigating to do with our partners on the trail and with the province who leases us the space. So we have to uh, do more work, um, but that is the, the budget figure that is um, proposed for the cost. Excuse me, Pat, did yes. we talk about the daycare roof? Did I pass it? Did I just skip right over it? Yeah. Oh, daycare roof, I apologize. Sorry about yeah, that. Thank you. So the daycare roof, let me just pull up my note on that. Right. So we've been talking about replacing the daycare roof for a couple of years now. And um, we are estimating that the cost to do the roof is 170,000. We have 82,500 in reserve. It is an expensive project because we're not just replacing the roof, we are diving into the substrate of the roof to fix what they call the, um, ma um, oh my gosh, I wrote it down in my other note, but it's basically those V's uh, peaks that are on the roof to provide the roof lighting. The way they are designed and, and on the roof is what creates a lot of the leak problems. So um, it's going to require engineering. It's not just a matter of putting a new roof on there. We have to basically open up the ceiling of the gym area and fix those. That's what we anticipate having to do. So in speaking with Val and her team, we would prepare in 2018 all of the engineering, 
all of the uh, construction ready documents ready to go so that we would be tendering that first thing in January 2019. And there would be very specific, once we know the exact work that needs to be done um, and the time frame required to do that in, then uh, Val and her team need to decide, are we moving the kids? Are we doing a two week shutdown? How are we going to be able to do this work with all the little ones? Um, because they don't take any time off. So we have to see if we can get into the school. So there's a lot of prep work. So it's not something that just we can dive in and, and do the roof. Um, so we're going to spend 2018, uh, $25,000 to get the engineering and the work done to design it. So we would be tender ready um, early 2019 and also have our plan as to what to do with all the little ones during that shutdown time. Okay. Um, the fitness treadmill, it's just a matter of our two treadmills there are uh, 17 years old. They have far surpassed what we ever anticipated being their uh, life expectancy. And we typically put money aside each year into reserves. So this year I'm suggesting rather than putting it away in reserves that we do purchase a treadmill uh, for the fitness center at $10,000. And the um, HVAC system for the fitness center, it, uh, when, once again, that building has quite a number of HVAC systems. Um, and the one that uh, causes us the most breakdowns and griefs and repairs is the uh, one that services the fitness center, squash court, and hallway into those change rooms and the east um, stairway out. So we're looking at uh, replacing that in 2018 at an estimated expense of $35,000. The floor scrubber for the wing and facility is also beyond its life expectancy and causing us a lot of breakdowns and grief, so it needs to be replaced. Just a little, I mean, it sounds so simple, the floor scrubber, but one thing we may be doing is looking at, um, right now, once a month, we have a company called Syntas that comes in, and Syntas does a uh, thorough scrub down of our change rooms and our washers, because they have a special system that it, I won't get into it, but it squirts the, the stuff out all over the walls and stuff and sucks it all up. So we might get a combo system, floor scrubber, and that eliminate that service and be able to use that in some of our other buildings. So we may end up spending a little bit more, but we will justify that on a cost savings with a contractor. We'll bring that back to council if that's the route we go. The CO monitors, we need carbon monoxide monitors in both of our arenas in the audience areas. Our suggestion is to do one arena this year and one arena the next year. Our estimate is about $10,000. They have to hook into our alarm and monitoring system, so it's not just a matter of plugging a little wall unit in, but that would be nice if that's all we had to do. Um, so we would probably um, look at uh, RFPing out both projects and then so that, um, and then doing one arena and then the, the other the next year so that we get economies of scale in one contract to do the work. Excuse me, Pat, this yeah. 10,000 for both arenas. We would need another ten thousand dollars next year to do the other arena. That's our estimate. Wow. That's our first, just rough estimate for the Blythe arena was around ten thousand dollars. So we've never had men before. But we have to men now. Yeah. So um, the last time that we had uh, somebody in um, looking at the um, exposure and safety and risk, they strongly, like they basically said, yes, you need to get those in your audiences, and, and that is required. We used to have a, a men one that staff would wear when they were in there, and uh, we didn't find it very effective. Um, but that now the new, all the new arenas are are installing them as they are built, and we need to retrofit our two arenas for that. Because we use a propane um, operated um, ice resurfacer, um, we have switched to electric uh, edgers, but we have that gas being emitted into the audience. And uh, we certainly don't want to have a carbon monoxide issue uh, at any time in that building if it's populated. River. Uh, the the uh, as it relates to the monitors, is there a monitor for regards to ammonia? Yes. So that so TSSA I, requires that in all arenas. So that so. Is, so that's something that like obviously that happened in Alberta, Alberta or yeah. somewhere. We have those monitors currently. Yes. But if there is ever a leak that. Everybody knows where they're like that. That happens. 
Yes. So um, the one in, they're different in each arena. The one in Wingham, if you've ever been in the lobby, you see the yellow light and the red light. Mm -hmm. Over that's that. So that is monitoring the um, room back where the equipment is kept, and that is all in a con concealed room. And if ever the, they reach a certain level, but what's funny about it is it doesn't have to be just ammonia. Anything that displaces oxygen in that room, those uh, alert. And when we're not in the building, they're uh, connected to our alarm monitoring system. Okay. The one in Blythe is an older system, and it has different gases that it's monitoring, but that also monitors it just in, in that space. It's not monitoring carbon monoxide in the audience. It's monitoring it in the uh, refrigeration rooms. And the other question you mentioned about the treadmill. Yes. How we, and not necessarily the treadmill itself, but equipment in the for the fitness center. We've been putting money away. Yes. This would say we don't have money, money left in reserves. If we take all the money out to buy something else. Do you remember what we have been replacing all the cardiovascular equipment over the yeah. last couple of years? Um, I would have to go get back. Because to that just tells that. me that we don't have anything left in reserves, and we're putting it all to taxation. This mm -hmm. that, that's what it tells me. No, what you what you're saying to me is that you're putting ten thousand dollars away every year. This year happened to be the year that you actually needed to buy one. So rather than putting the money into reserves, you're actually it's come up that it's the turn to buy one. So that's what she why she's right. doing the purchase. You what I'm saying is reserves. we're saying the ten thousand is hitting taxation and not coming out of reserves. Right. So what is it? Is it taxation or are we taking the ten thousand? It's, it's taxation. This one is taxation. This one is. But I think I haven't got the number. I might have it here what we have in reserves. Just a sec. We we've depleted a lot of it over the last couple of years because we bought all the new part, all the the other um, part of escrow equipment that had reached its life end, and. Oh, so explain to, just to, yeah. if if that is the case, explain to me why. We would buy this and not take it out of reserves. Because we don't want to take money out of reserves unless they absolutely have to. We would be putting every year we put five to ten thousand dollars up from the fitness center into reserves, whether I buy equipment or not. Agreed. So instead of saying let's put ten thousand dollars in reserves and then take money out of reserves to buy a treadmill, we're gonna bypass the into reserves and out of reserves and just buy not put anything more more into reserves this year. Mm, no, okay. it's this. How much? Just give me one sec. I, I have the hand, Donna's handy dandy chart here, which will tell me exactly how much we had at the end of the year. Fitness equipment. So currently, at the end of, does that sound right? I have it at the end of 2016, we had $10,000. That's so $2,016, right? Yeah. Right. And then we didn't put anything in this year, I believe, because we used it to buy. We bought equipment this year instead of using that tent. So I could, if you wanted to, you could use the. The thing is, next year I need another treadmill. So I have this ten thousand dollars in reserves. So we buy a treadmill this year, and halfway through the year, the other treadmill doesn't make it. I have ten thousand dollars in reserves to get the second one. We have two treadmills in the fitness center. But here's my here's here's the discussion that I'm I'm going with is. We got a 14.71% increase in spending. Like at some point you're going, you're going to not spend 14.71. Your chances are you're going to go to everything that you have reserves and you're going to go, I'm going to take out reserves or reduce spending. That's what you're going to do. That's the essence. The question is, is that, is that the right thing to do? I don't know. But my, 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 my question is, is that the idea is if you have the reserves, that's why it's there. You don't just, you don't just keep, like we just. I know our reserves are low, but you just don't keep racking up taxation until when you have the reserve. When you have a, a if we were at a one percent, I could see, I could understand raising it by whatever. But we're at fourteen. I, I, it's it's no, I conversations. I just yeah. want to understand the context of, because if. That's telling me we didn't have any reserve, and I understand the philosophy of what you're saying. I just, I'm not sure I agree with it, but that's that's me. Good. So since we paid that, we leased the equipment when we bought it for the fitness center. So once we finished paying the lease off, we started putting every year out of the fitness uh, operating budget five thousand dollars away each year into reserves, and looking ahead at how much equipment we have to buy over the next few years. This year, I made the recommendation to move that from five to ten thousand dollars. 
Then we looked at the equipment and realized we need a new treadmill. We can put the money into reserves. We can put 5,000 into reserves. We can put nothing into reserves and we can spend the $10,000, but then you have nothing left in reserves. And your membership <coughs> and your people paying for the fitness center are paying for that money to go into reserves to buy new equipment when it's needed. So whether we put the $10,000 into reserves or we put it in to buy the new equipment, it's an in and out this year. We have to buy a piece this year. If council chooses not to, we can spend the $10,000 and reduce that, but it's the membership fees that are generating the money to replace the fitness equipment. And I can give you more of a report on it, on the aging stuff and equipment. If the membership fees are generating the renewal, like I'm thinking that if we have to keep putting money into reserves every year for it, the memberships aren't paying the full renewal. Is that what you were coming at, Trevor? Well, or not? Past <clears throat> conversation about whether it's paying for the, the membership or the membership, the assumption in the membership fee is that they're going to have equipment. Right. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the assumption, not, right. not the fact that they're paying for it. The fact is that when I buy a $100 membership fee, I expect that there's two treadmills, not that there's none. So uh, the conversation <coughs> of what the membership is paying for, that's a different, that's a different discussion about the, that. But uh, it's, this was just a uh, philosophy understanding why it is taxation and not reserve. That was all I want to understand. So just, I'll just quickly answer your question. If you go back to the operating budget in the fitness center, um, reserve, uh, revenue this year is projected at 158,883. Expenses are projected at 113,966 for the programming side of the fitness center. <coughs> That's not the heat and hydro. That is that is under the other piece. So all I'm saying is that um, normally you would see that 113 at 123 because we'd be putting money into reserves. I can put it there for consistency. Last year our expenses were 125,895 <coughs> in the budget. So. We often exceed our revenue versus direct expenses against programming in the fitness center, and that is what that is being used for, is to pay for the equipment for the programming. I can give you further information. That's, good. Well, yeah, that's fine, Pat. Okay. That's right. just another question. Okay, the treadmill. How, if, you, if the treadmill broke down today, mm -hmm. how quick do you kill it? That's a great question. I'm not sure. Probably if, I don't know. Six to eight weeks at the longest. I might be able to get it in two to four weeks, depending if right. they have them available. Okay, and you're not, you're going to be able to get it. There's some value coming from this, generally getting rid of, or it should jump. Um, or, last time we, um, if I got rid of it on Gov deals, and I couldn't even get rid of two of the bikes there. So they're so old, but I might be able to get. Um, used equipment is our policies to put it on Gov Deals, yeah. which is a public trading site where you can um, potentially get revenue for it. Okay, thanks, Pat. The last one there then is the um, complex roof. Right. So um, the we are still waiting to understand the full impact of the. Um, Aquatic Center renovations. As part of that, if you remember, we created a negative pressure. So as Donna puts it, we no longer have our humidity um, invasion. invasion into the uh, fitness center, which was what, what's causing the leaks, is the humidity um, in the fitness center reaching up to the roofs, a cold roof in the winter, and creating condensation. We have noticed a reduce, uh, reduced amount of the leaking. We are still tracking it. And um, the fix, the next fix, um, we have uh, a budget number received of 113,000 to fix the next piece if we haven't resolved it through the humidity invasion problem, which we resolved with the uh, fitness, uh, aquatic center renovation. So I put the money in here as a potential that we may have to do this. If council wants to wait another full year to see what the situation is, um, we can budget some of it now and do it in 2019, but that is what it's going to cost if we have to insulate the roof to prevent this leaking. 
in your fitness center. That would insulate the roof. That's putting insulation over top of the roof. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just on that one section. Certainly not the whole roof. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Just one little thing. Uh, can you go back to the fitness squats? The, uh, HVAC? HV yeah, again. Mm -hmm. And just explain that one more time. I just I got all of that. Okay. So um, there are probably, uh, I want to say, seven or eight different mm -hmm. HVAC units um, over top of the complex. Okay. This is the one. So they're all reaching their 17, 8, 18 years old this year. And um, this is the one that is uh, we've been recommended to replace first. Um, and it's constantly being repaired so and broken down. So this is the one that we're recommending we do now. And in fact, every year we're going to be putting money aside to be replacing all of those HVAC units as they reach their life cycle expectancy. Um, this one does need done. We might put recommend to put another $35,000 away next year, but we maybe don't, maybe we can live with the ones we have. But um, the problem is these repairs take a long time to order the parts and get them um, roof mounted and, and things like that. But that is the one that services the fitness center, the lobby where you put your shoes on, and the, so the change rooms, the squash courts, and um, the east hall uh, area. You said we got the set? I'm going to say we have seven, plus we have the Dectron, um, which is a separate one just for the um, pool. Theoretically, it could be spent $35,000 a year now that they're all getting to the. You're correct. Know, that, it, that's not I'm necessarily not yeah. unexpected. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Pat, thanks. So, to summarize this um, slide, then, so this slide shows you that um, the $1,183,000 in revenue came from sources uh, like grant funding, long-term borrowing, reserves, and um, the and other, which was um, Sean explained about the sale of that equipment. So what that leaves us is that the money raised from taxation for capital is $558,368, and the portion that will come out of user fees for water and sewer is 61989 So that's how that... Um, net cost to the taxpayers um, of six hundred and twenty-three fifty-seven was arrived at. Donna, mm -hmm. on, so I picked this is on page sixty-two, and I noted this on my when I read it. The sewer part of the Arthur Street has no revenue. That's right. Why so, is that? Because it would be user fee, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Not reserved. So in, when we get to the water and sewer slides, you'll see that when you compare the revenue versus the operating expenses, there's actually enough extra operating revenue to pay towards that capital. <clears throat> so it's a user fee and it doesn't have to be taken out of um, reserve. Right, so okay. that's 61989 is the money that there is um, more revenue on the operating side than than operating expenses, and then therefore it can go to pay towards that bit of capital. Understood. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on then. So our next slide that we're talking about here is the um, transfers from reserves. So uh, we're looking at what would come out of reserves in 2018 to finance projects and what money we would be transferring back into reserves. Um, the net result is $674,000 increase to our reserve account, which is a step in the right direction. So as we go through um, the transfers from reserve first, every year we take the Westerio interest only, not the dividend, to offset the cost of the wing and, police, wing and police. And so that Westerio money was to belong to the wing and ward. And so that's what we've done to offset um, so a small portion of the wing and police costs each year. The museum study, there is a balance left over from 2017 of $8,015. Um, at this point, we um, so that was not spent last year, so we put it into reserves, now we're bringing it back out. At this point, Pat and the rest of us are going to be working on, do, you know, what will we get for that money, and do we even go ahead with it? So 
it's not costing <coughs> the taxpayers any money, and it all depends on some of the next report we receive for the museum study. Go ahead, Pat. I was just going to say none of that is intended to spend until we come back to council with our initial findings, right. and then we'll have some money if we need to go find out more information or do something. That's what that's for. Yeah, so we're, it's not going to be spent until we come back to council. Right. So it's not earmarked for anything in particular. Okay, so Sean talked to you about Arthur Street, and so we had eighty thousand dollars in reserves to pay to help pay for that project. The house and dam, we had seventy-one thousand dollars in reserve to help pay for that. The cemetery software project, we had um, fifty thousand and ninety-one dollars to pay for that. The Wingham Cemetery niche wall, twenty-eight thousand four ten. Pat explained about how the um, town hall theater renovations to finish that up was $38,000 of their money that we um, have had towards that project. The wayward signs is money we were holding from homecoming to complete that project. The fire hall grades, as I said, we put $6,500 in last year's budget and it wasn't done. So we'll use that to offset the $8,000 cost this year. And then Pat just explained to you that she had $15,000 255 in reserve to offset this uh, roof leak project that she was just talking to you about. So that's a total of 324,703 coming out of reserve. So then going back to reserves, then, um, so this year, and a lot of these are uh, you realize the biggest portions, of course, are the sewer and water long term reserve. So that gets us $612,000 into those respective reserves each year. And we've been able to build up, um, you know, some fairly significant capital reserves for both of those by implementing first that $10 per month and then $15 per month for capital. But however, one of the um, important ones, the very top one there, the asset management plan, you had a recommendation in your asset management plan to put in um, about $127,000 away towards future infrastructure. So that's in there at this point. As you know, under your fire agreement, if there's no capital um, purchase in the budget, then the money goes, there's a specified amount that goes into a reserve. And, and that um, if there is capital money purchased, then that comes off of that $122,000 and then the balance goes into reserve. So last year, when we purchased all the suits, then um, we, would, we only put $70,000 into reserve. But now this year, there's no capital in the fire budget, so the whole amount goes into long-term reserve. So for the police, they're putting away $10,000. For street lights, this is what we're talking about. We're anticipating savings, and so we're budgeting to pay back the loan for about um, $48,000. I've talked about the long-term water and sewer reserves. Um, we're looking at putting about $7,500 away in the cemetery. It could be for equipment or chapel or whatever. Um, there's a couple of projects out there that Sean's looking into. Sorry, Ray. Excuse, no, excuse me, no. If, if we get a page for that. This page? That, that, that blue page yeah. is on your iPad. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. And we'll flip back to your budget. Yeah, I just, yeah, is that okay? Yep. So then we have um, the cemetery equipment we were talking about. Um, so then Pat can say, in addition to the money that she was going to use to engineer the daycare roof, then to put a portion of the actual cost, which wouldn't be till next year, um, she's trying to get some of that money saved up. So she's got 18750 in addition to the engineering put away. Um, Rapid Man, we always put that $20,000 in for um, some sort of it. We hope that it goes into a reserve, but our luck has been that it's been spent on some leaky roof or some, some problem that comes up throughout the year. For Winga Marina, Pat is putting away $10,000 for an Olympia, which she does every year, and $15,000 for a refrigeration um, project. I, do you want to elaborate? Well, each of the uh, plants, the refrigeration plants in both arenas, are aging, and uh, we need to start uh, preparing for their replacement. Chillers, compressors, condenser, all of that equipment is going to be, need to be done in the next five years we're guessing five to ten we may luck out but we want to have the money in reserves because it's something you have to do 
and be prepared for when it happens. Thanks. So then we have the um, ongoing $12,500 that we recover from the Knights of Columbus, which we put into a reserve. And then for the Blythe Arena, then Pat is trying to save some money up for the flat roof um, down at the arena. And is, is that 10000 for the roof and 10000 yes. for the um, Olympia? Yes. Okay. So that's a total. So um, as I said, we're moving in the right direction there at this point by putting more into reserves and what we're taking out, which is what we want to see. Yes, Chuck. Donna, the, the asset management plan number, mm -hmm. is that is that allocated to a certain, like, it's not <coughs> into the trailer reserves is just a number of asset management plan. It's obviously split into all our different infrastructure, correct? Is that it's it's split into infrastructure categories not funded by user fees. Okay. Okay. So next um, this list is by no means um, complete. I put together um, some, some of where the reserve balances, which I know what they're going to be for the end of the year, but I do have a lot of work here to do on the reserves with, um, <coughs> with the department heads for um, where their projects have ended up. So just of note, um, one of the big ones <coughs> near the bottom, the gas tax, you see the big decrease there from 417000 down to 67000 and as you remember in our budget, we were taking $350,000 of gas tax out to pay for Westmoreland Street. So that was one of the biggest ones there. Um, development charges is up about $10,000. We've collected approximately $10,000 this year in development charges. And of course, we've talked about the water and sewer um, increases that the $15 a month generates. And for our working funds, the one notable thing there is that um, at the end of the year, then we'll be taking out all of the money, the $264,000 that we had saved up to pay for a memorial hall. Um, and so then that's where the balance of the 235 that we still owe. So we had 264 in reserves. We're going to haul that all out because now we've got to pay it. And then we still have to deal with so as the um, as usual, then I give you before the audit is complete a complete list of transfers to and from reserves and where your reserve balances are. Okay, so we'll carry on next. So I think Dwayne is going to take over here and speak to you about um, the FIR categories. Thanks, Donna. So basically, we're now we've now gone through the two proposed 2018 capital expenditures. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward. And um, you've seen this slide before, which essentially the service categories um, based on the provinces um, categories that they use is called an FIR. Um, the uh, Maybe moving to the next slide. I think the categories themselves are spelled self-explanatory, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about more of them, a little bit more about them as we go through. So, in terms of our first category, it's it's considered a general government. So, just for general information, it includes the coordinating and overseeing of the operations in the municipality. The, that function provides policy advice, and recommendations to council, facilitates planning act applications. If their accounts receivable or accounts payable or tax collection, it's a grant application function. Um, it monitors the budget, uh, also involved in marriage licenses, burials, and lottery licensing. Um, also administers special projects such as the police costing and the pay equity. And the human resources, the payroll function is all part of the general government category. So when you look at it from a staffing perspective, um, in terms of we have our council, we have our CAO, the clerk, manager of IT, treasurer, deputy treasurer, tax collector, our treasury assistant who does our accounts receivable, accounts payable, it includes our assistant to the CAO and our administrative assistant in our front office. So in terms of our operating, um, you'll see that uh, revenue, um, Revenue is uh, our OMF grant that we receive. We uh, allocate that all to the general <coughs> operating. Um, and as you can see, one point. Um, 
1.6 is our revenue um, expenses turned 52,000. So our uh, it's showing in that cost uh, or actually uh, benefit in terms of 1.3. Uh, members of council, we've allocated 95,000 towards that in our administration, 879. So this what this shows is from an operating perspective, when you factor in the ALF grant funding, uh, this department actually runs um, technically at a surplus of 375,960. But as you'll see, that surplus is absorbed by other departments. So if you want to just quickly turn to your purple budget for a second on page 11, that's the general government's uh, page there. So as Wayne was saying, the biggest part of that is in the revenue side is our OMPF grant. But just to point out on the expense side then, that is where we have um, some of our principal payments for our loans. And that is where you'll see the transfer to reserve for the 127826 of the infrastructure levy. And then we have our physici physician recruitment and um, council continued on with our energy and environment committee um, this year to purchase those trees. So those are um, just some quick highlights about the general government section. And if we move over to the page, to page 12, which is your council section. So one of the things I just wanted to highlight there was um, the removal of the miscellaneous expense. Last year we talked about this, Trevor, and so what we've done is we've moved it out of here um, so that it, because it's for things that council doesn't approve, so when we buy flowers to send to funeral homes and stuff like that, that's really more of an administration, administrative function. So that line has been taken out of your budget. And then when you um, make an improvement for something from council contingency, then we're looking for a motion of council then to, um, there won't be anything that staff is arbitrarily putting through there. Um, everything that goes through there will have to be a council motion. So that was um, what we came up with last year that we said we would incorporate into this year's budget. So, the, so this is where I, I've always had difficulty in, since I've been a counselor of, of what when stuff that comes up that is unbudgeted, mm -hmm. because I don't know what every like what is inclusive in every number, and I wouldn't okay. expect this to. Yep. How how do we know? I suspect we're waiting for administration to say you have the option to make a motion <laughs> to put it through council contingency if you so choose to want to do that. I have never had anybody ask or say that we could do that because I've never had something come up that says it's unbudgeted. Well, we have actually, and Pat can maybe speak to this as well, is um, so what we have used council contingency for over the years is many times throughout the year, you'll have someone standing before you wanting money for a dog park or for, a, yeah. for any of those types of things, electric car charger and on and on and on. Those that those are the types of things that weren't budgeted for. They weren't they weren't covered in anybody else's budget. But you have someone here asking you to support that. And if council chooses to support that, you have very little money to be able to do that. But we do have that six thousand dollars, and then that's where council passes a motion to say, you know, yes, we do want to support that. Also, just to add to that, though. Another one that Pat experiences quite a bit is, so we have these community rates now for mm -hmm. facilities and stuff, but we still do have some that come back and say, no, we don't want to pay the community rate even. So then if you felt really strongly about that, that's your, that's where you could pay for that. Room. So I, I think from a standpoint for, for me as council, when we're making the motion to approve or deny whatever that request is, that we're specific in where the money is coming yeah, it's always because in I, the motion well i don't yeah, again i apologize if it is because i don't ever remember seeing it as being uh, on a label as being coming out of capital council. or council contingency but that that's I, one I will, place we lean on the clerk to make that okay so yeah. I, I don't remember but again that's my my memory well, well that's what we'll watch you definitely watch for that in the future for you. Well, this, is, this is a small item but 
when we started to use the uh, uh, approval of uh, the uh, forgotten the, the term for the first part of the of the agenda. The consent. Consent agenda. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to me that the council meetings became much much shorter. Mm -hmm. They did. But it doesn't seem to be reflected here. Is it because it didn't make enough of a difference? I guess that's the case in the amount of time and the and the cost of council. Right. Well, your um, your honor, your you get a flat rate honorarium yeah. though, and so then and then that covers your your two <clears throat> council meetings that you go to. But then what we what is the wild card is all the special meetings that you right. have and we never know from one year to the next how many special meetings you may have yes and that wouldn't be affected by the uh, uh, consent agenda yeah it's a certain thought forever and i and i honestly believe that council not maybe this council but the council coming needs to look at that those committees to understand whether those are necessary committees mm -hmm. from a perspective of, of because again, as a counselor, if you're uh, on those meetings, you're being paid, which is through this honorarium discussion about what those costs are. And if it's no, if it's unvalued, then do we really need that committee? Because I will tell you that I'm associated to three committees that I don't think in the three years I've had a meeting. And the question is, why is that? And I'll tell you why it is, is because the contracts only get looked at every four years and the term of council so that's the part of what the discussion is about when those meetings are necessary or what those committees are and i think we were talking about that committees with through terms of reference and stuff but we haven't got all the way through them all but i think that is a definite discussion about the necessity of those committees because that determines that money right there not necessarily council meetings special council meetings do yeah. but but the but the committee. committee meetings are what really drives the, the funds, not necessarily council meetings. That's right. Okay, and so then we'll move on to administration. So um, last year in administration, like in the revenue part, that's where I was separating out capital because a lot of that revenue had to do with the theater upstairs, the donations, the trillion grant and all of that. So. Um, as you as you can see, as we move through the budget, the capital pieces are separated out, which therefore leaves us no revenue in the administration part. So what we're looking at here, the biggest change, and, and this will change a little bit further um, because Richard's been able to get a better price on that, but we have the um, election expense in here at 25000 Next round, we'll be able to drop that but to 23000 and then we'll have some of the money left over from... 2017 <coughs> towards it. So that uh, the next one that you're showing an increase there is on materials and supplies. So we have a list of things of, out front from laser fiche, which is our Im docu document imaging. Um, our postage meter has died. We have um, a number of um, computer backups, etc., that we're hoping to um, get through in 2018. So those things are in the budget at this moment. And then I've added a new line for that miscellaneous expense of $4,000 that was taken out of the um, uh, council's budget, but now included in the administration budget, <coughs> some of those things that we talked about before. And of course, we are looking at some savings in this budget um, with the elimination of the um, one corporate or director of corporate services position but also last year the reason the budget was so high there we had planned on getting <coughs> a financial analyst so those wages were included in that 516 and then that didn't materialize so that's why there's you know it seems like quite a jump but if you look from the year before to this year that's that's a more realistic look at that so Okay, so I just wanted to have you look through that and um, then we'll carry on to the next section if there's no questions. Okay. So moving on in terms of planning and development. So this is your economic development, the planning and your zoning and your drainage. Um, and the economic development 
uh, provide support to your local festivals, your local business and freedom associations, the Alpha Road Festival, and the Muskrat Festival, just to name a few. So we're supported by a part-time, uh, it's a full-time planner, but they're they're with us on a part-time basis, an economic development tourism officer, and a drainage superintendent that's uh, are under contract. So that's in terms of who's supporting this. Um, the uh, so this is what the operating budget looks like uh, for planning and development. Um, it's important to note that uh, you'll notice the stars inside community development. Um, this uh, component includes the fifty thousand dollars committed to the hospital and approximately three thousand dollars in the community partnership uh, donations that uh, council has provided and continues to provide. Planning and zoning shows a revenue of 8500 and an expense of $25,000. Okay. The expenses there are largely professional fees and support staff that are required to facilitate the development. Uh, revenue there of 8500 is that's based on income and planning applications. Um, so the more applications we get, the higher our revenue. And the drainage category includes, as I mentioned, the drainage superintendent that is retained through a consulting firm. I'll turn it over to Pat. Uh, who will uh, walk us through the uh, wrecking culture? You want to come up here, Pat? Are you okay? Right here. Okay. Okay. Is it warmer there? No. No, it's not okay, warmer here. Okay. So before sorry, I get sorry, 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 Pat. I just have a question about the drainage superintendent. Mm -hmm. So that used to be that used to be in the public works realm at some yes. a couple of years ago. We moved it away from that realm to this, but I don't know that it has ever come back to understand whether it should be internal or or we're getting our best bang internal, or we even have the resources available to that. So I'm wondering if that's something that should come back as a discussion, because I thought at the time that that drainage superintendent subcontracted was supposed to be a temporary yes. discussion. Not a, it is what it is, and we should forget about it. So I'm wondering if we don't, and maybe we don't have the resources available or the specialty, the the, the specialties to do that. But I think it needs to should come back to council yeah. as a as a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to pay for it one way or another anyway. Uh, the thing of it is, I don't disagree. That, yeah, uh, it's I fully agree that. Going to the engineering firm was supposed to have been a short term basis to get us through uh, getting projects done that needed to be done. But we were thinking of trying to get back to a drainage superintendent uh, that would be a little cheaper than the hourly rate for an engineer. So once Sean gets settled, I'm sure we can have those discussions with him. So, um, excuse me. So, in the meantime, I had a quest for a drain. Who do I talk to uh, or to look into a drain to, for? A, well, I know it's the tool drain, but so do I just come in here and get the stuff and look at it myself or just Sean? Or how do I do that? I, I so certainly talk to Sean. Yeah, yeah Sean, you, you would talk to me and then I would uh, be detricked at this particular point. Yeah, and it may not be, but process. you may be able to even solve it. Okay, Pat, so if you want to start, so sure. um, just in case you did want to follow along, then um, page 37 is Pat's first budget in your purple uh, handout. <clears throat> the first one is. Uh, Air transportation? Oh, I, I went to parks first. Okay. Sorry. Well, before, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. before I dive into the details that are in here, I just wanted to maybe provide a bit of an overview of the 2018 yeah. kind of direction for the Recreation Facilities Department. Just take two minutes to do that. Um, our focus in 2018 will be to continue to implement the Legend software. We have established an internal goal to achieve 50% registration online by fall 2018. So that's a lofty goal, but we are we are bound and determined that that's the, the direction we want to head. As far as capital projects, a lot we've talked about. We'll be wrapping up Memorial Hall, still a few things to do there. The police station roof, supporting the town hall theater committee, 
preparing for the 2019 daycare roof project, replacing 1H5 with a complex, um, new floor scrubber, new treadmills, new <coughs> equipment, the roof leaks at the complex, and a lot of work on the bridge of the Greenway truck. Those we've already sort of talked about. The museum study, another thing that our department is going to be focusing on. As always, we have a focus to increase utilization without increasing our debt at all of our uh, recreation facilities and programs. Um, we are going to be challenged in our department to manage the impact of Bill 148. We have, we, for every full-time employee, we have probably four or five part-time employees. So we have a lot of work to do in that area. And uh, so that's going to be, uh, there's a lot of legislation being implemented as of January 1st, 2018, and another bump of it in 2019. And it's not just about wages, it's about shifts, hour shifts, <laughs> notice of shifts, all sorts of things that we are going to have to wrap our heads around and change the way we operate without trying to increase a lot of our costs. Um, we have the airport study outcomes and hoping the council will review that and have some direction for us. Um, the recreation master plan is something that um, I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but that's on our plate as well. Talk about the CO monitors and um, uh, we want to solve the com uh, what is that? Oh, we want to solve the complex water humidity infiltration process, or proceed, whatever you always call it, invasion problem. So the benefits of a master plan, this is something that we've talked about a few times. I really believe that it's time for this municipality to uh, leap forward and get a master plan. It enables the North Huron to assess recreation needs in the interests of the community members, prioritize resource allocation decisions for new facilities, rehabilitation projects, or manage life cycle planning. And when I say manage life cycle planning, I'm sort of saying, do we need five ball diamonds? Or when one, you know, are we, are we gonna allocate one that when it is at the end of its life cycle, we are not renewing it. And we already have that in our plan. And so that's just an example. I'm not saying that we are doing that. Please don't say that. I'm just giving an example. When we talk about recreation planning, in order for us to really get the biggest bang for our buck, to find the most revenues possible, to get councils input on what they want to put the most support towards and hear from the public what they want in recreation and how is our demographics changing? What do we need to be able to offer 10 years from now that we aren't offering now? Or we need to rehabilitate current facilities or programs to meet the, the needs in 10 to 20 years from now, we are really looking at a map recreation master plan and having that roadmap laid out for us and that is why we want to spend this money this year on the study so that council can sit back and make really well thought out decisions about where we want to go. In 2017 and 2018 overall staff changes we had the minimum wage cost increase so $19,000 of that increase was I just took the entire 2018 budget as we would be staffing for the programs we're offering and then I added anybody who wasn't making $14 yet and gave them $14, and that got us $19,000 increase. So you can see how many part-time staff we have and how that's impacted. It's going to take, what are we going to do about our boots? Like, now that we're paying the staff $14 instead of ten seventy or whatever. So we are, uh, we are going to have a lot of work to do as a team with council and our department to really manage um, where we want to go with some of our stuff. Um, we did reduce our Blythe uh, rec operators uh, part-time hours from 3,782 to 3,494. We looked at the last two years how many we were actually using in the button, how much we had budgeted, and really we have a 7% decrease in the number of hours we need. And this is based a lot on reduced number of ice rentals, so we're able to adjust part-time hours to match that. Um, increased frontline office staff, we've had that report come in and we're still under review of that and we'll bring you back a report in June on that. And uh, as I mentioned, all the changes for Bill 148. Uh, we have made a big change in that we have combined REC and complex admin as one budget cost center. When the complex was built, we, um, it was an arbitrary decision. My predecessor and the council at that time said, Let's take all of the recreation administrative costs, take 25% of those and allocate that to the complex costs. And um, it doesn't change how much it costs to operate the department and everything that we do. <coughs> the complex is the only cost center we apply any administrative costs to, yet it's the staff at the complex that are booking everything at all of the facilities, the Blythe facility, and doing all the administration for all of the facilities, 
And I think a few years ago, some of you will remember we tried the experiment where we added a small percentage of our fees to each building. And then we were told to not do that next time. That was councils, and that's going back and forth. And how do we really work through this fee? So it's a huge process. Every time we have an invoice to split it, 75-25. We could buy a $3 stapler and have to split that 75%, 25%, make sure we got the race cost center. It's a lot of work for the Treasury Department. It's a lot of work at coding. So it doesn't change our overall costs. So I just said, let's put all this one budget. And then if we want to split out a percentage at the end to look at what the complex cost is, we can do that. But it's the same cost no matter which way we go. So that is the decision I've done to simplify our budget and simplifies our processes as well. So if we just want to take a look at the services that the rec Recreation Culture and Facilities Department provide, it's the parks and the trails. I think at one point we calculated almost 85 acres of uh, parks and trails in each, each town of Wingham and Blythe. The trailer park in Wingham, the campground in Blythe. We have all sorts of recreation programs, whether they're free drop-in programs or pay-as-you-play type programs, day camps, day play services, all sorts of things going on in the rec department. I left a copy of our new rec and leisure guide on your table. That goes out in the mail at the end of this week, so you're getting one hot, hot off the press. We have our aquatic and fitness programs, the pools and the facilities that are for those. The three arenas are the well, William, Belgrade, and Blythe. Two concession booths. We also do have another concession booth at the Oculus Ballpark in uh, in Wingham. It didn't operate this year because that's typically leased out to a group that, that uses it for fundraising, and uh, that didn't happen in 2017. Three halls, the Knights of Columbus in Wingham, the Blythe Community Center, the Belgrave Community Center, and then, of course, there is also a hall, the Blythe Memorial Hall, the lower hall. Two libraries, one in Wingham, one in Blythe, the <coughs> museum in Wingham, Blythe Memorial Hall, and the Wingham Town Hall Theater. I will uh, talk about, uh, <laughs> I, we'll get to each of the budget costs in a minute. As far as for staffing then at our facility, uh, I do have an organizational chart if you want a copy of that, but basically there's a full-time fitness supervisor that supervises two part-time fitness instructors and four to six contract class instructors. So those fitness instructors and class instructors are really working when there's people in the facility calling upon their services and then one supervisor who also teaches classes and does cleaning and oversees the entire facility. Aquatic supervisor has uh, ranges from 6 to 12 part-time lifeguards during the year to cover off the aquatic center. And the recreation program administrator is a full-time person and they also have the support of one full-time and one part-time front office administrator to cover all of the front office hours. The director of recreation and facilities, full-time day camp supervisor, it says that, but it's actually seasonal. So we don't really have someone 52 weeks a year. <laughs> she just comes on when the camps are running, as well as the part-time, uh, six part-time day camp leaders, they're seasonal as well when the, the camps are running. We have a part-time recreation program and um, we have many part-time recreation program instructors, whether it's the jujitsu or the gymnastics or hockey for fun. There's a number of instructors that um, are overseen by the program coordinator. <coughs> There's a clerical and marketing assistant and part-time airport operator. So a lot of the stuff under airport operator and the FIS falls under transportation, but the airport is under our department. Um, facility staffing as well. We have to manage all of the facilities. Two full-time managers, one in Wingham, one in Blythe. There are seven, I think I figured it out, uh, there are, as far as recreation operators, there are only two full-time recreation operators in Wingham. The rest are three part-time in Blythe, one part-time seasonal in Wingham, two part-time all year round in Wingham, and that makes up all of the recreation operator staff. <coughs> we have a uh, part-time concession booth supervisor and anywhere from 10 to 15 concession booth workers at a time, and then one full-time general laborer and two part-time parks operators in the summer. So that makes up the staffing complement. So if we want to turn to this page, it gets into sort of grouping those activities together into the revenues and expenses. 
just want to get to my, there's really, um, I think maybe what would be better um, is to actually go to the different pages of the budget. Just to, yeah. um, so, so if you turn to your budget rather than this, we can keep up there. But starting on page, uh, what did you say? I'm Parks not following is on different 37, but do you want programs first? No, that's okay. I just, although the airport was actually first um, okay. in order, uh, 3,500. But ultimately, under, I'm sorry, I just have all of the other, I had all the buildings also here, is what we were doing. We really so talked about all the capital. Airport page 26, if you want to come to it. I have a different, um, that's okay, I'll get it. I got a little tab here for it. There we go. Basically, the airport um, operating budget, there is very little change from the previous year. We're just really waiting to see what this report has in store as recommendations, and then council will have an opportunity to review um, those recommendations and make any changes. So I'm not going over each facility's facility building budget, like the police station or, or whatever, no. because that's really going to be handled by each of those. Okay. All right. Turning to the next one, which is uh, in parks, the 7100 numbers. Basically, um, there's not a lot to change in here uh, from previous year to next year in Blythe or Wingham Parks or in the East Wallenach Park. Nothing really big changes in the trailer park. No big changes in the Blythe campground. And the Recreation Aquatic and Fitness Program. So this is the first time we've kind of grouped these three together. Uh, their total revenue is just under 400000 389000 And expenses, those expenses include all the heat, the hydro, electricity, water, and all of that that's allocated to those specific areas of the complex, the Aquatic Center and Fitness Program. And I can tell you that the one that eats that the most is the Aquatic Center. <laughs> Under, um, sorry. So then we've taken the three arenas and grouped those together under all of their revenue and expenses. Um, other than the major capital things, there's no, and the reduction in live rec operator hours, there's not a significant real change to the arena operations this year. Two concession booths is going to require our attention in 2018. As you can see, we are not making as much as we uh, we've usually broken even, but now we're going to be losing a lot of that as the minimum wage. Trevor, so it, it begs the question the fact that brand new arenas are being built today without them. This stool is a prime example. They don't have a concession booth at all. So the question becomes is, is that something that's feasible for, for North Huron, in my mind? And I don't know what that looks like from a replacement to, to that. Like, I don't know what that looks like, but I think today the way it's going, um, we're never going to see that. We're never going to see that positive, that that full minimum wage increase has got to go to the prices of the goods, which then therefore reduces the sales. So, I think it, I think at this point, with with the impact of Bill One Forty Eight, this would be an opportune time to at least review those two services to look at whether that is something that is even whether we can gain some ground operationally by not providing those types of services and providing some other level of service. Um, I'm just thinking that it, just based on the fact that today, mm -hmm. they're not they're not putting them in new arenas right now. So in a review of, uh, it's, it is a hot topic at most of our directors and managers meetings when we all, and the email that came today, you know, does anyone have an RFP to rent out their booth? So uh, arenas are really moving to renting them out to a third party which we have tried multiple times to do, and we can try and do it again and see if there's any uptake. Um, a number of them have removed them altogether as a service and have gone to more vending machines. Brussels is an example of one that recently did that. And you're right, the Listful one was built without 
There are a handful that make money, and they are located across the street from the high school. And they open every day at lunch and serve fries and Coke because the schools can't. So we're unfortunately unable to do that. Um, we have to definitely take a look at those services and see if we're going to be opening them in the fall. The challenge um, will, I mean, there's many challenges with offering and not offering them. We don't get the sales like we used to. And 20 years ago, the booths were huge money makers. Um, but that's when the minimum wage was a lot lower. But people don't want to pay any more for their fries than they used to 20 years ago. And people are more health conscious. The healthier food costs more. We can't move that before it becomes perishable. So I don't disagree with you, Trevor. I think that, that is something that we need to take a, to consider our options. And it may be different for each town. So how soon can we close them? Uh, I'll go to Trevor first. So let's. So, so my question is, is to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, we look. Yeah, go ahead. But what I'm saying is, we look at it. it you, you could close them tomorrow by just not having them. Yeah. Like it's, there's, you just lay off part time. You don't have part time staff anymore, and you take a product. That's as simple as that in my mind. But what I'm looking at too is not necessarily just those concession booths is we got to look at these other services that we provide and i use and, I, and i'm looking providedly at the, the trailer park not the trailer park the campground and the trailer park in perspective where those are specific areas that have specific costs that we even we've got our rentals whether it be cost or whatever should be user pay we should break even at the least and if we can't then we got to provide we everybody's going to say we can't continue to raise the price of the, those items and i'm going to say if you raise the price by 20 percent and reduce the, the use by 20 percent, you're no worse off you're no worse off so we're always conscious about raising prices because we always think we worry about we raise the price we're going to lose the people providing it. But my question is ultimately these are the low lying fruit that we got to start talking about. These are the difficult decisions. And I know this was a difficult decision back when it was, but these are the types of things that we have to either raise the price and make them user fee to break them even. Or figure out what whether we're going to offer that service at that rate. Period. Brock, uh, I, I think we need to look at a lot of these issues from a much much broader context. I think I think we we should be looking at the sustainability of North Durham. Period. At that broad broad level. And. Uh, for example, when I when I, I look at the at the uh, suggestion of doing a, a recreation policy analysis plan, the recreation study, uh, yeah, master plan, plan. master yeah. plan. Uh, I, I think that's too narrow a focus. I think it has to be done in a broader context of looking at the viability of North Huron as an entity. And I, I can see I can see where there are many many. Uh, issues that will look very different whether we're looking at Blythe community or at Wingham and and to, to just pick one and, and look at it but without looking at the as a broader picture I think is is uh, going to short change us it's not going to bring us to uh, a really valid <laughs> conclusion it's it's a it's not an easy thing to deal with on a broad basis but I think that we're, we're just uh, rearranging the the, the bits and pieces, if we start at the level of a concession booth, for example, I think we, know, we need the, con the wider uh -huh. context. Concession booth is a very minor part of a recreation mm -hmm. master plan. Mm -hmm. And the recreation master plan is everything within North Huron. Mm -hmm. And that irregardless of where it's sitting, it's... It, is it in the right place or, uh, and, but the one thing that I'm coming back to right now, from Bill 148, all we've done is put in the extra wage for the hours. What I have been led to believe from county staff, 
is for every extra dollar that you pay out in wage, the other things in that will cost us three to four times as much. So that there's a whole bunch of jobs that Bill 148 are going to tell us we can't offer those jobs anymore. Very bad if I'm... No, no. I can't okay. disagree with anything that's been said at the table at this point. It's just the council needs to give us direction how they want us to proceed. Yeah. And uh, I think um, uh, what I've tried to provide here with the Recreation Master Plan, uh, it's a starting place and it provides you with that roadmap and it provides you with the answers when someone comes in and says, we want a dog park, we want a skate park, we would like this and this and this. If your plan is looking for that, let's partner up and let's get that done. But if your plan is suggesting no, what we need are pickleball courts and indoor pickleball courts and we need to convert something to that. I'm just using that as an example because that is an up and growing huge activity for 50 plus. And uh, so a, a master plan provides us with that hard evidence of where we want to be so that we're just not closing everything. We're actually repurposing our facilities, our, our fields, our, our trail to something that we need. We are looking at where council wants to put their support as far as how much we often talk about 30% for this or how much should we support that. We need to take a look at all of that and I think a recreation master plan can do that. For the concession booths, I don't disagree that we need to assess them. I'm not sure I want to close them tomorrow. They're only open until the end of the ice season, which is the end of March. We're at the second week or the first week of January. So we could use the summer and the time from now to the fall to assess um, what a lot of the costs are with frozen. There might be you need more vending machines that offer something with protein in them because if you're serving alcohol, you have to have that available. Those kinds of things, which we would definitely take a look at. Um, but you're right. I we clean up more Tim Hortons cups after hockey games than we do our own. So there is definitely people that are able to just get, and it's their local businesses are are at you know very close. And now that Blythe has more opportunity for that as well, maybe it's time to take a look at different options. But each community is unique in, in what they need. So. The trailer park we've been through, the campground, they're very two different conversations. I don't think we want to talk about them together, but they're definitely ones that we can review and could be part of the master plan's consideration. Thanks. It's, it's page 51. Is that the hall that's up in the arena and live? Can you show me that? Because no. I have got a different copy, so my page numbers are different. Page 51 is the Blythe Hall. That is the hall in the arena, yes. It's not a very big money. Correct. <laughs> so if you remember in 2017, yeah. in 2017, we had set a target to offer a liquor license at the Blythe Community Center in hopes that that would turn a lot of that around. And we are 50% of the way there. We've got the application. Like it's a long process to do that. So we are still very much in the process of getting that license done. And that will be another focus, which I didn't mention. It's a carryover project from 2017. We believe that a liquor license will increase our revenues at the Blythe Hall. That will be a full service bar, which would also serve alcohol to the arena floor. It can be taken out for a ballpark. It can be used as a license in a facility in Wingham. So the municipality will be operating the bars and hopefully using some of our volunteer forces to help bartend meaning the Legion or Lions or some of those people, and then they would be benefiting their organization by doing that. So we have a lot to bring to council on that and also to discuss with the public. We've been working on how the policies would look uh, with the AGCO at this point. So what you're doing in applying at Blythe for Blythe Community Center is the catering endorsement. Correct. For those who don't know what that means, that means it can be picked up and move to another facility that we own for a one-day tournament or an event or something like that. You know, this involves hiring more staff, of course. Right. So, yeah. Right, but it also involves selling alcohol to gain revenue. Yes. So the idea is that I, I guess you could turn to the Belgrave Arena and comment on the success that they've had with their liquor sales as far as a revenue generating source. 
Um, that's because we have a super deal uh, with the bar manager, uh, basically. He's doing it uh, free of charge as a donation to the community. Mm -hmm. Right? But even as that, he's no great community, but you pay him. Like, what have you know, the pay him? But he's, he's volunteering. And okay, that's the other thing. Possibly we should be looking as it was setting up a wide, arena board, just like Belgrade, and let them hunt the way it was before. I'm looking at that I strongly. Seriously. We um, give them so much money <clears throat> that board run, the same as Belgrade. But Belgrade is very well. Well, uh, being part of that board, I don't want to bring that in. But the thing of it is, the one thing I'll say, we have to change the way we've been doing things drastically. And in both Wingham and Blythe, there are certain things if we are going to continue doing them. We have to have some kind of volunteer base to step in and do that because with provincial rules, we're being put out of business. So, I just want to call, I just want to quickly just comment on Councillor Bodden's comment about sustainability. If somebody can explain to me how you take the broad approach to the municipality to understand whether it's sustainable or not, without looking at individual services, I would be glad to look at that, what that looks like. But to me, the fact is that we've looked at the broad scope for the last three years with very little change and i'm thinking we're now too far to go to this broad scope discussion are we sustainable or are we not well that is we, we need to understand that but in the context of what services we provide versus what we can afford to give that's the conversation about sustainability not what what everything else and the issue that we have to focus on is, in my mind, not having these these individual groups or whatever of, of, of arenas or whatever the case may be. We are a municipality of North Huron. You want to have a, group, uh, a discussion about an arena board or a, a rec board or arena boards? The Wingham and Wyeth and Belgrave Arena Boards should be sitting in the same freaking room having a discussion about their operations. This discussion about having piecemeal discussions ever all over the place isn't, I don't think we're doing ourselves any favors. And that's the part where we have to start thinking about ourselves as North Huron, not Wyeth, East Wallenosh, and Blythe or Wingham. We cannot do that anymore. And I know everybody likes that, but it, it, we're, we're too far. We have to start dealing with it as North Huron, not our individual perspectives. Brock? And I, I, I agree with that in, in, in many senses, but at the same time, our, our previous, our interim <coughs> uh, CAO, <clears throat> made reference to the fact that we can't afford to have three arenas. And and I knew exactly what he meant by that. And and I I would assume that he was thinking in terms of well probably closing down the Blythe Arena, which which we can't afford. Blythe cannot afford it. We have to look at it as a as a as an entity. And uh, I mean but on the other hand, the broad picture when we see in our notes that uh, uh, the, the operating budget needs to increase by 1.3 million over the next five years. That's not sustainable. That, that's that's impossible. So that's a, a broad picture that is telling us that we've got to do a lot of things differently. 
go ahead. But. Okay, so just to take us back to, <laughs> to the thing I was talking about. So a lot of great suggestions, and I could spend hours talking about each one of those options because I've grappled with them and we've discussed them. And um, I think uh, we would need to be careful on many levels about just fully turning a, an arena over to part-timers. You asked us to prepare some information about what's mandated, what do we have to do uh, versus what's not mandated. And just a refrigeration plant, which Belgrade does not have. Uh, requires that um, somebody be there at all times when the facility is opened, that every day, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, every day someone must go in and take those readings, that it be monitored and alarmed, that it is a very, and I, I'm not sure, but perhaps after what happened out west, there'll be even more regulations, but the TSSA is very particular about ammonia plants. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to take away complete oversight of that, but I'm all for more volunteer support. So maybe there is some way that we can have a private public partnership um, that maybe would be slightly different than the Belgrade one. I mean, when we look at what, I mean, the Belgrade Community Center does not operate at no cost to the township of North Huron. Right. There's still a heavy donation made there. And so perhaps that needs to be considered as, as uh, if they're doing well financially, then maybe that least needs to be Consider before you think about the Blythe and Wingham facilities, which provide a lot of community support for minor sports and seniors and things like that. Those are um, core, new, well-built facilities that, um, but this is, I guess, what I want to go back to. That's what a recreation master <coughs> plan will tell us. It will tell us what we truly need, what we truly need in 10 years. So we're not sitting here guessing it's exactly where we are today, 10 years from now, still wondering if we should close one of our arenas. Um, maybe it'll come back and say, no, there's ample opportunity for you to have a lot more ice usage and here's what you need to do. Um, we don't know what a, what a study would tell us. They may come back and explain how the campground could be better utilized or not. I'm not sure or how, what we should be charging um, for usage. So that's where we kind of went with this conversation to start with a recreation master plan as our sort of uh, providing a direction. And in that, council will have an opportunity to express what their wishes and wants are for that. If it's to save money, if it's to look at greater revenues, then that can be the focus of their future. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but any of master plans, or if you've been through any of them. But it shouldn't be a document that just we get and sit on a shelf. It should have a plan going forward, and they might be able to provide us some insight. So that would be something we would like to take a look at doing. Right. Uh, uh, do we have any idea what it might cost for this master plan? Yes, $50,000. Yeah. That's my guess. Um, based on what I've asked a few other municipalities and had them done in the last few years, what their cost was between forty dollars and $50,000. The other thing, too, is it, it, Trevor talks it's all, it's all going to be one. Well, it does have to be one. We know that. But you cannot drive people to go to one place shove it down their throat. They're going to go where they want to be. We can keep saying, yeah, it's all one. And it is all one. We know it is. But we just keep talking it over and over again. People are going to be where they want to be. Okay, go ahead. Trevor. I don't disagree, Ray. Yeah. That's, where the, that's where the master plan will help us decide where that... The people are going to go where they're going to go I know, anyways. I know, that's, I know what you Blue Water is doing the same discussion. Blue Water is having the same discussion about a master plan. And they tried to bring in Goddard into it. Because they wanted a larger in the county into it. They wanted a larger discussion about recreation in the county. Yeah. Problem is that's not what happened. And the Blue Water is doing it on their own to figure out what we all know what the media is about arenas and stuff in, in that municipality. So let's like yeah. it is what it is. Like what we what we have to talk about. Dollars. Yeah, but, well, but fifty thousand dollars to save a potentially tell us ten dollars. Tell, tell us what to do. As opposed to and with public input that's the different part we could sit here and talk about it with public input out the wazoo right yeah. but now you specifically get them to get that input for you as opposed to us doing it and half the time our our public doesn't believe what we're selling anyways so again i, I think it's a big number but the conversation is it's only a big number if the book if the book sits on the shelf and you don't do anything about it that's the problem that I think a lot of these plans have. They have a shelf life, 
and they sit there. The councils choose not to follow them. That's, I think, the, I think we can't do that anymore. And that's where this whole study about airports and all that other stuff, we need to take a real look at them and make a decision on, are we gonna agree with this study or are we not? And if we're not gonna agree with it, we stop doing studies. Because <laughs> I forgot to see. That's yeah, the question. If we stop doing, if we keep asking to do the study, <coughs> we have to do something about the study. If we're not going to get anything out of it, stop doing the studies because it's it's just costing you more and more money. Well, maybe just a comment, just in terms of looking at your expenditures. Your recreation culture is your second highest expenditure in municipality. You're spending over, I think, it's two million dollars, mm -hmm. or around two million dollars on your recreation, and your protection is two point three something in that like they're very they're, those two are very close um you know in terms of generally speaking uh public works tends to be your highest expenditure um in, in municipalities or one of your highest but your rec and your protection are far exceeding your your public works so i think going back to the earlier point in terms of the recreational master plan i, I hear what counselor Alhan is saying in terms of 50,000, now that's a budgeted figure, it could come in less than that. Um, but when you look at the fact that you're spending $2 million, $2 million, 50,000 compared to 2 million, if you achieve savings through the recreation master plan of 100,000 over two years, you've returned your, your dollar on your, your, going back to Trevor for Councillor Sykes comment in terms of you've got your return on your dollar. So just I just want to throw that out there in terms yeah. of you're, you're spending two million on rec and culture and there may be opportunity for efficiencies. Oh, um, and Dwayne and I and Yolanda are going to the Roma Convention. We have an opportunity to talk to the Solicitor General about the different things that they keep passing acts in the provincial parliament causing us to have to do more documentation, dot the I's, cross the T's, which in itself maybe isn't all bad, but in the restricted budgets that we have, it's killing us. And it's killing all municipalities, probably under 50,000. Uh, and that if some council members could please in the different acts, let me know, or Yolanda or Dwayne, that the specific points you want us to take to the Solicitor General, uh, that's like every act, we are just being mandated to do more and more stuff. Hire more and more people to keep track of what we are actually doing, <coughs> rather than letting us go ahead and do things as to what we can maybe get away with doing. Um, and it's all part and parcel. And that I think the provincial election in June, uh, I think that's going to be fought on a lot of, as to whether municipal governments can Afford. I just wanted to make one comment more for Pat. For yeah. she's mentioned this conversation about programming is neutral, like program revenue and expenses are neutral. That's the intention. That's the goal. That has been the goal. We'll never achieve it in the aquatic center. Or but that has than been, we ever work. Yes. That has been the goal, yeah. and that is what we have communicated to yeah. the taxpayers from the from. I will tell you that these budgets don't reflect that. So the question is, if we're telling them something, and it's not, and it's not doing, and we're not doing it, my argument is we have to do something. Meaning, the conversation about user fee, right? Like if we're going to say the programs are going to make, are going to have them neutral. neutral, then we have to budget that way. No other discussion in my mind, because that's what we're telling our ratepayers. We're told them that in the membership fee that your membership fees are covering your programs and whatever. And if we can't afford the program, we don't have it. Well, that means 
should be our budgets for those programs in RAC should be no cost, should no increase in taxation in my mind. That's only what I'm, my opinion. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I will show it differently so that it's not all clumped together with the heat, the hydro and everything else under aquatic and fitness programs. So I just want to point out that for rec, aquatic rec and fitness programs bring in almost $400,000 in revenue by user fees. That's more than anything else we're charging out for. And that's not including the ice and everything else that we charge for. We bring in almost a million dollars in revenue. So although our expenses are higher than roads, by the time we collect our user fees, we're less in net. So I just want to point that out that we aren't the most expensive department, but I'm not saying it's cheap. It's still a $1.4 million net cost that we need to address. Recreation is a service, just like everything else a municipality does. It is not a profit-making center. If it were, the private sector would pick it up. It is for the masses. And when I'm talking about a master plan and council having that opportunity to say, what do we want to supplement and what don't we? I really think we need a strong formula in North Huron so that staff can deliver that. So is it skating for the public? Is it minor sports? Is it What is it you want to support? The facilities will not break even or come close to it because they are not... They're providing a service. They are not, they are public service, just like a lot of the things the municipality does. I just wanted to finish on this list. If you just go back to, we also have two libraries. We just kind of got held up on concession booths there. The two libraries, although they are operated by Huron County, uh, we do supplement them in their operating expenses. We have a museum. Um, which is a net cost of 28,000 when it's operating. Memorial Hall shows 62. The 50,000 of that is our debt obligation. The rest of that is the cost to insure the building the municipality pays and a small staff fee when we have to go over there and as the landlord and do some work. So I just wanted to finish off with those last three if there's any questions. Great. I don't think we can compare the recreation with the roads department at all. It has nothing to do with it. There's nothing in common with them. The roads, we have to have them. It has to have us money. Yeah. We've got to have the streets and have the roads. So it's yeah. recreation culture. This is what we got to do. Well, it's what Trevor's been coming at. Thank for, you, Adam. Right since you come back, came on to council, is what do we have to do? And what would we like to do? And we have to know the difference. So, um, um, like I have a nation mandated not for next meeting. Um, go ahead, Trevor. In my opinion, I don't think at this point. If the conversation ever comes to that discussion, I think a report's going to be requested from staff any days about what our requirements are legislatively. So <coughs> at this point, I don't think we're in a position for that. I think we're, I think this is more of a discussion about where our priorities of sitting. Sure. Yeah. And this is, this is a good discussion that we have to have, whether it's we're going to get a decision on it or not. Yeah. We have to have the discussion about what those priorities and these are the low lying fruit or the hard ones that we have to talk about. And I think we're having good, good discussion. <clears throat> it's just that how do we get to the point where we make, what information do we as council need to get that decision made? And that's where I think we're not there yet, but I think what we're hearing is if we ask for the information, you can provide us that type of stuff like legislative requirements or not. So. At some point, Ray and yeah. the rest of council, we're going to have to have the say, okay, whatever it is for a, a service and we're going to change it, we have to get a report from the council anyways to ask of all the scenarios and acts issues that we're going to have, then we can make a decision. Right now, we, there's too many unknowns about certain things because we don't know the day-to-day -day operation of some of these services that we just can't make a decision today. But it's these ones that I'm talking about we we maybe have to ask the question, maybe a report needs to come back so that we can know all the information so we can make a decision on whether we need the service or not. That's the part for me is, is during this budget deliberation, because I know we're not gonna change it today, 
And by the time the budget gets approved, we're probably not going to make that change decision already. But at least then we can say, once the budget's there, here's the discussion, bring the report to talk about that, <coughs> and then let's make a decision before we have to do this discussion with the budget preparation in August, September. Because then we're already in a lame duck, but at least the conversation can start and the reports are gathered for when potentially a new council <coughs> can come in. At least they're hitting the ground running. They may shelf it, but at least they have the information as opposed to not. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on then to the social and family grouping. So, sure, so Valerie couldn't be here tonight, so I'd like to say I'm Val, but I'm not. So this includes the Wyndham Child Care Center, the Early Learning Program, the Early Years Program, the Before and After School Program that's offered at the Maitland River, as well as the Before and After School Program that we offer at uh, Sacred Heart. And so in terms of, uh, from a staffing perspective, uh, we have a manager of child care services. We have six early childhood educators, which are full-time. We have 18 part-time staff for all programs, and that's on average. We have a child care clerical assistant, and we have what we refer to as a food service person. So I won't go into this in any great detail, simply because uh, Val would be the better person to talk to, but just at a high level. Um, as you know, these are program and services that we provide to our young families. So um, it's one of those, uh, you know, you need a service. If you want to attract uh, young families, this is a service or a service that you know they certainly would be looking for. Um, and uh, the department's budget does rely on transfers from other levels of government and uh, more specifically the county. And it also relies on user fee from uh, uh, families that are accessing and utilizing these services. Um, and just in terms of the budget themselves, if you look at um, the uh, well, I guess the bottom, the net cost to taxpayers, as you can see in the bottom right corner, in terms of the draft budget, is approximately thirty-eight thousand dollars. But you'll see when you look at the net cost, again, cost of the taxpayer, the child care, um, the net cost is one twenty-nine. But if you look at the early year program, the before and after school program for Maitland and for Sacred Heart, uh, those actually are are um, beneficial. I, I, I hazard to use the word profitable, but uh, certainly it shows that they're operating in a surplus. Um, and when Valerie does her budget, she looks at the overall, she looks at the entire uh, budget overall. And as a result of those um, surpluses, it that brings down the deficit to the $38,000. If you took away those uh, surpluses, as you can see, your deficit <coughs> would really be around the one thirty hundred thirty thousand dollars mark. So, you know, in terms of um, just there's been uh, having those programs, um, you know, and offering those programs has certainly been a benefit. Uh, and it also, again, as I've already indicated, you know, it's a service that young families look for, especially in terms of trying to attract labor to the area. So, so the only the only question that I've had is, and I know this is with regards to fee the fees, and you know. Um, when we look at what we, how we set the rate, I know the conversation has been we look at other municipally owned daycares. The concern is, is that there is non-municipally owned daycares that are run also. That we should be, they are direct competition, period that we should be establishing our pricing to be comparative across the board about who our competitors are. And, and in my mind, from what I'm looking at and what I, what I, some stuff that I've looked at, is I think we are shortchanging ourselves on, on certain fees with regards to the, the, the newborns, only because of that in other municipalities and other profit or profit oriented ones, their rates are almost double a day than what ours are. The question is, why is that? I'm only using one example that I looked at. But my question is, is that that's this conversation about to increase the, 
the cost or increase the user fee but lose 20%, you're making the same amount. The question that ultimately becomes. So I think we need to start looking not only at just municipally stuff, but we need to look across the sector as about what full sector. the full sector to see what are are we comparative or are we shortchanging ourselves what the market's willing to offer? Because yes, we're in here in county, but what do we offer? What what does our service any different than those other sectors? Probably not. They're all legislated, they're all mandated by the government. So why are we getting shortchanged by that? So that's where I think we need to look at not only municipally owned stuff, we look at across the sector. There has been some people who have tried to run their own private daycare. And the liability is too high. Those people. And a lot of those people have dropped out of it. So that's why our daycare is running at limit. There's a waiting list for kids to come to our, to our daycare. Maybe we're cheap. I don't know. I never compared it, but I know of two people who had their own private daycares. They actually got out of it because of liability. But there is a number of, and I'll say uh, that there's different groups that run. And I think uh, Trevor's right that we have to take a look more on sector wide uh, as to seeing what is charged anyway, and that uh, it would give us an idea of because. If you're talking about municipally run, basically there's us and Godreach that really uh, are comparable in that uh, sphere where there's a whole bunch of other ones that it's different ownerships, different uh, uh, managements. And the, Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we're going to move ahead now to the health section. So we'll be looking back to Sean then to uh, speak to the um, cemeteries here. Given the fact that we're kind of rolling into all things public works related, uh, if it's okay with the council, I figured I'd go ahead and give a, a bit of an overview uh, similar to what uh, Pat was able to do. Certainly. Uh, I'll probably go on near the detail, but uh, basically where we sit right now, we're completing, um, dare I say, the post-shared services restructure. You know, it's been a very tumultuous uh, couple of years, and we're at the point now where we've got all but one of the uh, vacancies filled. We have a lot of retirements and, and departures from the uh, municipality, and we've assembled uh, very good team of uh, individuals. We are quite pleased to see the, the people that we have here. Uh, so really the focus now, if I were to say there was an overall focus that I'm concerned with for 2018, it would be on, on looking at uh, the quality of the service delivery that we're providing for the for the township. You know, so getting that, that focus back to, to uh, uh, the internal level of quality that would be considered acceptable to uh, to council and expected by the rate payers. Um, there's a couple other projects that I think are, are critical importance uh, as we come into 2018. One of them, uh, and Donna touched on it earlier, was that uh, some whole vehicle and rolling stock management. Uh, you know, looking at proper uh, extra departmental costing so that we have a, a really solid idea what it costs in terms of rolling stock to uh, to operate facilities, to operate parks, recreation, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that really extends out, we go even further to say that we, I'd like to be looking at, my intention is to look at a viable documented replacement strategy. And I say strategy because it would be very easy to calendarize something and say, okay, there's your dollars. It's a very easy exercise until you look at the numbers and you realize that they're not necessarily viable. So really, i got to take a step back and look at a strategy and see what would work for the for council and for the township. And that exercise has already been started, but we've got a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting to do on that one, to be honest. Um, 
as I look at, at uh, what's in that office, I've got bridge studies, I've got road mean studies, we're, uh, we're in the early stages of water and wastewater master plan, all very, very good documents. And one sits on this shelf and one sits over here and one's over here. In reality, um, the next very important step after the master, the water and wastewater master plan is completed is to pull all of these documents and a wealth of knowledge. But, uh, you know, I've dealt with situations where we paved over roads and then a month later tore them up so we could fix the water main underneath it. You know, good information, but not at its full capacity when it's not pulled together. So uh, the goal here would be to be bringing forward or developing and then bringing forward a sound long-term capital plan. That, that looks at replacing roads when they need to be based on the overall infrastructure. That looks at um, the water and wastewater plants, their state now, where we're heading with them. And I think this is something that's achievable. Uh, you know, again, this, this uh, master servicing plan is critical. And this all ties back again to what we're really striving for, and that's new development. You know, that we need to aim. There's, there's a, a bunch of projects that really need to be on top of. So that's one of the, the, the heavy goals for 2018. Um, being there's a lot of heavy lifting involved with that. It's certainly something that's being undertaken now. My hope would be that we've already looked at it by the time next year. Um, aside from that, uh, we've got a number of service delivery policies. <coughs> we're trying to narrow down or nail down roles and responsibilities and interactions. We've got Veolia, we've got a team of people there that that we're trying to integrate with and work with when you get into a water main replacement or that sort of thing. You know, everybody needs to know what everybody's role is. And we've made great strides actually in the last couple of months to say, okay, we've got a water main. These are the, this is the line of delineation for, for Veolia's tasks. This is where we pick up. And that's something that we're trying to carry forward with, with facilities, with rec, we're trying to, you know, these are things that are coming in the next uh, next several months, I suppose. So, and all that to say that uh, now, as we dive into the the uh, budget itself, you may find it very difficult to compare last year to this year because you're not necessarily looking at an apples to apples comparison. I've moved things over based on, <coughs> and I think they should be based on my past experience or where. I think they should be based on the data that we were able to collect in 2017. So it'll be very hard for council, I admit, to, to look and say, okay, we spent this much in roads last year. Why is it so different this year? Well, maybe I moved a bunch of it over to, to sanitary. Maybe some of it sits uh, in the landfill and that sort of thing. So just bear with me as we go through, and hopefully I can answer your questions if you can cover them. Trevor? So, Sean, in saying that, that might be one of that. A point form discussion about what items you've moved. <laughs> something, <laughs> just like a high level, I'm talking. I'm not talking to the funny detail, but something like that, so that we don't get bogged down in the discussion about why does it not look like that. We already have it already in mind sight that you know we're not asking each every question that we can just say, look at this page and it says here's the differences compared. I think that might help. Stop the question that you're going to get bombarded if that's if okay. why this doesn't look right compared to last year. I can definitely speak to that, you know, and provide that. But uh, just the, the quick and dirty answer is that most of those changes were surrounding salary allocation, the vast majority. But there's some vehicle stuff as well. So yeah, I can hear, I can definitely <coughs> clarify that. I think that's a exercise that's it's already been done. It's just a matter of condensing. Uh, so as we move then into health, um, this speaks uh, to, to cemeteries. <laughs> and um, <laughs> <laughs> poor health. <laughs> Very poor. It is the title. <clears throat> and it's surrounding Wingham, Fly, and UW, both the open and closed. Uh, not much to say other than, uh, you know, second bullet is burial services, additional charges apply in, in off-season. One of the things we've already noticed and, and uh, we're looking at for 2018 is, is possibly a clarification on how things work 
particularly in the off season, you know, because there's there's always and it's not unique to to North Huron. There's, there tends to be some some concern over over that closing period and some of the costs associated with with uh, off season burials and that sort of thing. So we're that's something that we have been discussing internally and uh, are going to try to work through. Um, basically, uh, when you look at the overall here, on the on the next page, it speaks to 0.5 of an FTE, and then Donna very quickly pointed out, in, in reality, it's that moves, it varies depending on the season and depending on, on the demand. Uh, it's probably closer to 0.6 of an, of an FTE that's that's dedicated in terms of our full time. Uh, the remainder of the time that individual reports to uh, public works in Wingham, you know, in the off season, but he's always available uh, to apply uh, to be applied as a resource to to the uh, cemetery operation. Um, there is one seasonal summer student that we uh, we bring in yearly to assist with the the lawn care and maintenance. Uh, interesting one is the the chapel, the related structures. You may or may not know this that. The, uh, the structures at Blythe were, were recently updated. They've got new, uh, new roof, new uh, cladding on. They look actually pretty good. I was uh, impressed, uh, particularly given the late time of the season. So it's looking better there. The chapel in Wingham's an entirely different uh, situation. Um, I have some personal concerns having gone through it. Uh, I think that before we apply any taxpayers' uh, resources or funds to it, we'll have a closer look and have a professional opinion on it. There, there is some uh, some areas of concern I have, and I leave it at that. And uh, once I get better detail and better data on that structure, you can expect a report to be brought forward to uh, to address it. In, in more detail. Um, Are there any? Uh remaining concerns in on non-resident burial or, or sorry with me so right now like north huron and morris turnberry um people don't pay the non-resident fee but everybody else does time. so they're they are compensating us somehow Yes, in last year, 2017 budget, Morris Turnberry made a contribution towards the cemeteries and then we budgeted for that as well this year. Now, I, I think that's under discussion. Um, yeah, so Morris Turnberry has set correspondence indicating the cross border servicing agreement schedule. I forget what it is they want to um, have for <coughs> regarding it. And one of the items on that schedule is the, is the 25000 that Morris Turnberry currently towards our cemetery costs. So where that discussion is going to go at this point, I don't know. I can only, I can find, but I can't say. No, it doesn't include uh, Central Huron. No, they we're, we're not dealing with Central Huron. Central right? Huron, um, if there was a resident from Central Huron that was being buried in St. Paul, uh, they would pay the non-resident rate um, Morris Turnberry provides that financial contribution okay. so that we don't, so we waive that non, we don't apply the non resident trade right. to their residents, to their rate payers. Just your last point well, there, really, Sean. And yeah, that's the, the final bullet point there. Uh, I think it would be the expectation of, of all the council. If there's additional work, we pull those resources from from public works. So, you know, it comes into that with sharing the resources uh, to get the job done. Right. And so, for this year, we're looking at revenue coming in at 113000 and expense of 140 So, a net cost to the taxpayers of about 27000 But the cemeteries will cost us. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. Next one, of course, is environmental, and that uh, deals specifically with water, wastewater, and then uh, on the management side. Uh, as everybody's aware, water and wastewater services are fully funded by uh, user fees uh, uh, 
again, everybody's aware we have Veolia who uh, contracted to uh, to operate the water and wastewater facilities for the uh, for the township. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do get, work fairly closely with them uh, wherever possible, particularly when you're getting into uh, water main repairs, uh, collection system repairs. And we do that to keep costs down. The, the last thing I want to see is Veolia always calling a contractor, uh, paying that contractor, marking that up, and then invoicing us. And that's, you know, I suppose the business practice would dictate. So there's times that we can't or, or don't have the available resources to, to help you. So you will see uh, contractors maybe doing some of the excavation work, but a township uh, employee with a township truck on site working with the OLEA. So, you know, we, we work in whatever configuration is necessary to A, get the job done quickly and efficiently, and B, keep the cost to a minimum as possible. Trevor? John, as part of that agreement, I do remember that the OLEA was to provide public works with a list of projects that they believe that they should incorporate and we were to provide a list of resources that we would be able to provide to them during that discussion is that is that what's actually happening with regards to the agreement that's what's happening now uh I've had opportunity to meet with them a couple of times to really start working through some of that because they, in all fairness there, there was a tremendous gray area when it came to, to water main and, and collection system work, uh, we got into the same issue when we were working <coughs> with a, a particular developer. We needed Veolia's expertise. They weren't really clear or comfortable being there. We've since resolved that, and so that now they know that they're working on behalf of the township. So yeah, we're still, we haven't got all the answers yet, but we're, we're making good headway. Yeah, I think I did I answer yeah, the question. No, no, yeah, you did. That's it. Yeah. Really have stepped up the uh, the interaction between township and uh, and Veolia as well. So that goes along. And the, just remind me, uh, Sean, what year we're in with this con? Like, where is this year two? This is year two. I think we go to two April of, 2021. So it's two of five, right? Was it five year? It's a five year. Five year. year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, curbside pickup, recycling, and landfill operations. Very interesting one. Um, as you're, as you're all aware, there is a fairly significant cost associated with the operation of waste management within the township. Uh, that's something that uh, is, you know, probably worth looking at as we move forward. Um, having come from another municipality, I can say that I was extremely impressed with the, with the quality of the landfill operation here in terms of its its compliance. Uh, the operational function of it. Um, there's, I'm sure, optimizations to be, uh, to be realized if we looked at the overall waste management. It's, uh, bullet point two is very important. Um, there is a portion of the, the administration and public works wages that. Uh, that are tied to water and wastewater operation that we recoup through user pay. There's a tremendous amount of work that's done in Treasury in terms of water billing and that uh, sort of thing. We've got administrative support, the front uh, office that, that does water related work. Uh, I'm directly involved in water and wastewater work on a, on a routine basis. So those costs are captured on that user pay portion um, and, and tracked. As far as the landfill, yes, we have uh, one dedicated um, part-time. He's been there for a long time and, and, and is well-versed in uh, what's expected of him over there. And then what we did is uh, we brought in a full-time employee. 60% of his time is is dedicated specifically to landfill. The other 40%, he comes into it. Um, did a couple of things that allowed us to um, Kind of share the resources instead of hiring a full-time person in Wingham. Uh, so it, it works out well. We can be offsets kind of some of the peak demand here and at the same time in doing that uh, by tying it to public works operations as well we were able to recruit because as you can well imagine uh, it sometimes can be very difficult to, to recruit for a part-time 
plan for the panel. This this seems to be working very well, and it's, it's a new position as well. Um, and then uh, all of all of councils aware there's there's fairly stringent reporting requirements uh, associated with everything to do with uh, any function that reports to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Control, and those are all taken care of uh, through Public Works as well. That includes. Although Veolia does the does the reports, they're still headed through public works and brought forward to council. Uh, as far as landfill, that's a lot of uh, reporting that's required there. That's all at this time contracted uh, currently through a uh, local service provider, vetted through the office, uh, through public works office, and uh, council as well. And uh, when you look at your environmental service costs, uh, again, I, I mentioned it, although there's, there's a fairly high dollar, dollar value associated with it, at the end of the day, uh, we're still not, uh, we're not cost neutral on this one, uh, largely because of the waste, uh, waste disposal of the environmental services piece, which I think is an opportunity to some savings in there. Well, I think it was just looked at. So when, until that contract is up, I don't think it's, in my mind, it's up for discussion. We get a lengthy discussion with that. Now, the one thing we didn't have a discussion with was with landfill. Um, I think that would be the only area in my mind that, um, that there was a discussion a while back uh, from the previous CAO about User, fa user fees not being where they need to be from an example of, uh, of those to compensate for the cost of disposal in the end of the landfill. So that would be the only one in my mind that hasn't been looked at in the time frame. And anything to do with curbside collection, I think it's a, that's, that is a discussion that's been had and a decision has been made to council and I think we drive on and I don't think it changed that decision is going to get changed anytime soon. Has there been the recording of close in the one in Homesville? Pardon the left, the big municipal landfill killed in Homesville. There will be neighboring municipalities that have into that one that are going to be looking for places maybe to uh I don't know if anybody um, has contacted you. I think it closes next June, is it? Uh, it actually uh, Exeter uh, is okay. will be taking uh, stuff in the short term anyway, uh, possibly for something in the neighborhood of five to ten years. Okay, I just heard you were supposed to that, that, that is the county deal. Okay, folks, so here we are at about nine o'clock, and so I'm just trying to gauge how you're feeling here. You're ready to cut it off for tonight, so so um, thank you very much. I think we've made a lot of progress, and I think we've had some really good discussion tonight. So what we would like to do tomorrow night is to kick up at transportation then, and, and so Sean can maybe um, have the opportunity tomorrow to look through some of the things that uh, we were talking about. So we'll start with the transportation and then we'll move into protection as well and cover off fire, EST, the policing and building official and such like that. So um, those are the two that we'll start with tomorrow night then. So then um, what I would like to do is um, after we do that, then if there's any areas in the budget in particular any pages in particular that you would like to come back to and have a more in-depth look at let we'll we'll spend a little bit of time on doing that and then what we'd like to do is close out the meeting um for the last slides which um are entitled topics of discussion so those are um you know some some um, things we've talked about before and we've heard about them before, but yet they're, um, they're items that we can certainly give another go around to or get some more information on or, or hear, um, hear what you may think of it. 
And then also then we're looking for some direction from council as to, you know, um, we need to move along with this budget. Uh, my next plan is to gather the troops um, early next week and have some SMT meetings over the budget and over the discussions and priorities and directions that we get from you folks at the end of tomorrow night. And then we can go forward and, and uh, do a second round on this budget once we have a better idea of where, of, you know, some of the priorities and, and um, some of the things that are important to you and some of the things that we can take a look at uh, further to be able to pass this budget. So anyway, I think we're well on schedule and uh, so I appreciate you tonight. So tomorrow night, if we would have the same um, um, time frame, six until around nine, then we maybe we'll finish a little bit earlier tomorrow night. If any questions? Yeah, I'd give up some of on the internet. You just throw another log on the fire. I know, it's oh, cold in here, isn't it? I don't know why it's so cold. I, I have to look at that thermostat tomorrow. There's something it's, it should be warm. temperature's warmer. dropping. In I know, summer. and I set it up, so I will look into that. That'll be my <laughs> new number one to a job tomorrow. Figure out why it's so cold in here. I'll tell you right now, if you're cold, right? What do you think she's like? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to throw my bed down here. Well, so here, to some chat over here. <laughs> Okay. 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 Thank you. So if you that's everything. moving to six point one confirmatory bylaw. You want to move Yolanda and Deputy Louise Campbell. All in favor? Carried. Adjourned. Councillor Site. Councillor Ritzman Tenenga. All in favor? Carried.